Kia ora, and welcome to Game of Thrones in about three minutes. It is a game for three to six players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is over three hours. It's a pretty complex game. King Robert is dead, and his son Joffrey sits on the Iron Throne. Stannis Baratheon declares him illegitimate and claims the throne, as does his brother Renly with the support of House Tyrell. Robb Stark declares himself King in the North, and the Martells and Greyjoys ready for war. Only one can win the Game of Thrones and triumph in this clash of kings. Will you take the Iron Throne, or will you become a feast for crows? You win if you capture seven cities. The game then immediately ends. Competitive. Only one house can win the Iron Throne. Hidden orders. Orders in this game are placed on the board face down. Card management. Cannot reclaim cards until you've used them all. Auctions. You make bids for power or to defeat the wildlings. Player turn. Each player has 15 order tokens, 10 basic defense, raid, march, assist, and consolidate orders. There are also 5 upgraded orders, of which you can only use as many as your place on the raven track here shows. Orders are placed on the board face down, and then revealed simultaneously. The Iron Throne track determines player order. Raids go first, and can remove an adjacent assist or consolidate order. If they remove a consolidate order, that player loses 1 power, and you gain 1. March is next. You can march from one area to any others adjacent. Ships act as bridges for movement, making areas linked by ships count as adjacent. Combat occurs when you march into an enemy area. Combat strength is counted by the units in the fight, as well as any assists. Knights are 2 strength and footmen 1. In this case, black has 6 combat strength and red has 4. The red march order doesn't help here. Black has 3 assists and red 2. Each player then selects one of their leader cards and adds its value to their total. Optionally, you can also add tighter battle cards, adding their strength to your total. Finally, the black player uses the Valerian Steel Blade to add 1, and because they are ahead of red on the Fifestone's track, they win the tie. Defeated armies retreat. Swords on leader cards determine unit losses, but each tower symbol blocks a sword. Consolidate is last, and allows you to collect power based on the number of crowns showing. At the end of the turn, you reveal cards from these decks. Deck 1 will contain mustering and supply cards which determine if you get new units and how many units you can support in your armies. Deck 2 will either have you gain power or bid on positions on the tracks. Bidding is closed and ties are broken by the player holding the Iron Throne. You bid on each of these tracks one after the other. The final deck has game changing events or wildling attacks. Wildling attacks are also bid on based on where the wildling marker is. If you win, the highest bidder gets a benefit. If you lose, the lowest bidder gets hurt. Why would you like this game? This is the definitive Game of Thrones game if you want to capture the feeling of the epic battles for the throne in the first half of the series. The game shines when it is played like a diplomatic game, where deals are made and alliances maintained until they end with sudden but inevitable betrayal. The various tracks and how you bid on them makes for some very interesting decisions, especially for the holder of the Iron Throne who decides ties as they can punish their rivals and boost their allies. The diceless combat is great, and I personally do not like playing with the optional tides of battle cards. And each house has their own hand of cards with unique powers and abilities. The best thing about this game is winning as House Lannister. However, this game is not remotely casual friendly. I have heard numerous horror stories of fans of the show picking it up and just getting overwhelmed by it. Early mistakes in the game can essentially eliminate a player from winning and result in them sitting at the table for hours not having much fun. Oh, and if you're looking for Daenerys and her dragons, those are in an expansion. Game of Thrones shares a lot in common with the classic diplomacy, and for casual board game fans of Game of Thrones, I'd recommend checking out The Hand of the King. A Game of Thrones, the red wedding of games. Kia ora, and welcome to Above and Below in about three minutes. It is a game for two to four players. There's no solo mode. Playing time is around 90 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. Your village was destroyed by invaders, causing you to flee with your family in the night. You lost everything to war, and your refugee caravan has wandered far and wide looking for a place to call home. You found the perfect place to settle, with lush arable land and tall trees, but beneath the village are vast networks of tunnels. Can you learn to cohabitate with the people below, and can you build a thriving village above? You win if at the end of seven turns you have the most village points. Village points are represented by this big gold symbol. Competitive. Only one player can have the coolest village. Set collection. Gaining a variety of resources will score you a lot of points. Narrative. You can go on adventures with narrative decisions in them. Player turn. Actions in Above and Below require villagers to take. Villagers can have hammers, which means they can take the build action, and quills, which means they can train. And every villager has dice values that show how good they are at exploring the world below. There are five main actions shown at the top of the player board. Explore, harvest, build, train, 
and labor. Explore requires a minimum of two villagers. Draw a cave card and roll a die. Then another player looks up that entry in the storybook and reads it to you, giving you options and telling you how difficult they are. Choose an option, then roll a die for each of your explorers. You gain a number of explore successes based on the number shown on each character, in this case four. You then gain any rewards listed, move your villagers to the rest area and take the cave card into your play area. If you fail, you can injure any number of explorers to get additional successes. Build allows you to buy a building, paying the cost in gold. You could build above buildings at any time, but below buildings can only be built in an empty cave area. Train lets you get a new worker into your village from the main board. Harvest lets you take goods from your buildings and add them to your village. And labor gives you one gold per villager. The first village to use labor in a turn gets some cider as well. Some cards and story effects will change your reputation below. They are represented by the torch symbol. A high reputation increases your points. You may also trade goods with other players at a minimum cost of three gold each. At the end of each turn, you may only refresh as many villagers as you have beds. Cider can refresh an additional worker, and if any workers were injured while exploring, a potion can heal them. Also update the available village recruits. Keep playing until seven turns run out. Why would you like this game? Above and below walks an interesting tightrope between a traditional set collection and optimization Euro game and a more thematic adventure game. For me, the adventure parts add some variety and flavor to the game, but the game itself is still focused enough on traditional game ideas that you can never feel the adventures break the game. In fact, you can win this game without going underground at all. The player who collects big sets of goods builds most effectively, and gets good use from the end game buildings will always win. The art, as always with Red Raven games, is stunning, and I love that all the villages are unique. Little things like that make me feel the designer love making the game, and there are a huge variety of unique buildings in the game, both above and below. The best thing about this game is how I get to talk in my silly goblin voice while reading from the encounter book. However, the combination of thematic and Euro elements may put off avid fans of either style of game. If you like story games, you may be put off by the fact the game is normally won by pragmatic building and resource collecting. And if you love your Euros dry, the dice rolling and randomness and exploring may turn you off as well. If you like the story aspect of this game but want more, check out Near and Far, the sequel game that takes the narrative to the next level. And for a more traditional game without dice, try Village. Above and below, THIS IS MY GOBLIN VOICE! Kia ora, and welcome to Arkham Horror 3rd Edition in about 3 minutes. Review copy used. It is a game for 1-6 to six players. There is a solo mode. Playing time is around 2-3 to three hours. It's a pretty complex game. The dank wind blows in over the river docks in old Arkham Town, carrying with it the fetid stench of rotten fish. A deep, unsettling fog has lowered all around, and the curtains are drawn tight. Something is not right and you know it. Shadowy figures have been meeting in secret around town, and people have gone missing. Only you seem to have noticed it. Can you solve this mystery and avert the oncoming disaster, or will you be driven mad by the horrors you uncover? In each game, you'll play a different scenario. Each scenario has a different map, different monsters, encounter cards, and a set of story cards that form the codex. You win and lose each scenario based on what these cards tell you to do. But in general, getting clues on them helps you win, and getting doom on them makes you lose. Cooperative. Everyone is working together to defeat the servants of the old ones. Narrative. This game has a lot of story-based encounters. Dice. The core resolution mechanic in this game is rolling dice based on the matching skill. Fives and sixes normally count as successes. Player turn. Each turn has four phases, the first of which are player actions. Each player can take two actions, the most common of which are move up to two spaces on the map, although you can spend a dollar each to move up to two extra spaces. Ward, which allows you to remove one doom token per success on a law check. Focus, which allows you to increase a skill by one. Focus tokens can also be spent for re-rolls on any roll. Investigate, which allows you to place clues on the scenario sheet with an observation roll. And you can also fight and evade monsters. Defeating some monsters gives you remnants which are a valuable resource. Once all players are done, the monsters move. If a monster ends up in your space, it attacks doing damage to health or sanity. If you take too much damage, that character is killed, but you can get a replacement one. Then each character resolves an encounter card based on what region they are in. There are normal encounters and clue encounters that are the black and white cards. Clue encounters are the main way of advancing the story. Once all encounters are done, you draw two tokens from the Mythos Cup for each player. The clue token means you draw the top clue encounter card and shuffle it into the top two cards of the matching deck, then add a clue to that location. 
animation. The Doom token means you add a Doom to the area shown on the card, and the Gate Burst symbol means you add one Doom to each area in a region. Too much Doom in an area can make it unstable, and that makes it harder to win, as further Doom tokens get added to the scenario card. The Monster token spawns a monster from the bottom of the monster deck, the Headline token means you draw a Headline card and resolve it, and finally, the Reckoning token triggers any effects with that symbol. Mythos tokens from the cup don't go back into it until it's empty. Why would you like this game? Arkham 3rd Edition comes with a lot of content in the box, starting with a good number and diverse range of characters. I also like that you can choose from sets of unique skills and equipment for each character. And there's all the usual Arkham file stuff, lots of spells, equipment, and allies to recruit, as well as a huge pile of encounter cards, both for the city itself, as well as encounters for locations with too much doom. The best thing about this game is that each scenario has its own set of unique clue-based encounter cards, as well as codex cards, making each scenario feel quite different. However, this game is very managed. Clues are needed to drive the story along, and they get on the board from the Mythos Cup, which means the game's length is fixed in a way. And that can lead to turns where your actions are very obvious. Move in ward an area to remove doom, or stay still and focus so you can get the next clue encounter. It's a tighter design than most of the Arkham File games, but that comes at the cost of its spontaneity. In many ways, this game is closer to Eldritch Horror in its design than it is to Arkham Horror 2nd Edition. And if you want more story in your game, check out the Arkham Horror LCG. Arkham Horror 3rd Edition, Eldritch Horror City Edition. Kia ora koutou, and welcome to Assembly in about 3 minutes. Review copy used. It is a game for 1-2 to two players. There is a solo mode. Playing time is around 15-30 to 30 minutes. It's a pretty simple game. You are stuck in deep space and something has gone terribly, terribly wrong. You need to abandon ship, but the ship's computer seems to be preventing you from escaping. Can you use the correct override commands to rewire the computer and get the hell out of there in time? Or will you be left floating cold in space? You win if you manage to lock all 12 modules into the right rooms before you run out of the deck of cards three times. Cooperative. If you are playing two player, you will need to work together to escape. Card management. All your actions are based on cards. Player turn. Before you start playing, each player picks a character card. Each character has a one-time special ability that you can use during the game. You then place the 12 rooms randomly in a clock formation and then roll the d12 and place one random module onto that room. You draw three cards each and these are kept secret from the other player. On your turn you may ask the other player a question about what they have in their hand and they must respond truthfully, yes or no. You then play a card. If they have a matching card, the order is verified and you may proceed. The wild card counts as all types. If they do not have a matching card, you both must discard one card. You then resolve your card. This one allows you to place one new random module, rolling the d12 again to place it. If you roll an occupied room, place the module in the next location clockwise. The swap card allows you to swap the positions of two modules in play. You can then use this card's other function which is to lock those modules in place, turning them face down. The rotate clockwise and anti-clockwise cards allow you to move all modules one space that chosen direction, and you always skip lock modules. When you run out of cards the first time, add a rotate either card and reshuffle, and the second time, add the wild card. You then take all non-lock locations into hand, leaving the modules behind. Shuffle the cards and redeal them out, placing the modules back on their new rooms. For solo play, there is no verification, but you have less cards in the deck to play with. Play until you run out of time, or all 12 modules are locked. Why would you like this game? If you like puzzles and brain burners, this could be a good fit for you. It's definitely a game for people who like tight logic puzzles that can be solved solo or as a shared experience. The basic game has blank clock faces, but you can add different sets that increase the challenge considerably. And the Glitch's mini expansion also has a lot more of these, which adds more replayability. The art is simple but effective. You don't get the modules confused with each other despite there being 12 of them. And I really like the chunky module tokens. It's also a small box game, which makes it portable and quite affordable for that reason. The best thing about this game is that it comes with a challenge mode that suggests no talking but using hand signals instead, complete with a recommended guide of signals. However, this game is a puzzle and it does not feature a sweeping epic narrative or emergent gameplay. It's very mechanically tight, but it's nothing more than that. And as an independent game, it might be hard to find in stores. I will link to the publisher in the comments below. For a similar co-op puzzle experience, check out Shem Phillips' Bethel Woods. And for a less puzzle, more lasers space co-op, try The Captain is Dead. Assembly. I'm sorry Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that. Kia ora koutou, and welcome to Batman Gotham City Chronicles in about 3 minutes. Review copy.
cannot be used. It is a game for two to four players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is around 60 minutes. It's a pretty complex game. Dateline Gotham. A horde of rogues and other criminal elements have descended on the city. Crime is rampant and the citizens are in panic. The police are overwhelmed by the shocking savagery of these new villains. We need a hero, a dark knight to save us. We need the Batman. At the start of the game, pick one of the scenarios to play. The heroes win if they manage to complete the scenario goals in time. The villains win if they don't or all heroes are defeated. Teams. One player is the evil villain and the other players are working against them. Dice. This game has lots of dice rolls. Player turn. Each scenario will have a setup guide that shows the villain player where all their minions are placed and spells out the victory conditions and any extra tokens needed. The other page shows which heroes are available for each player and the villain's starting tiles. Each hero has a board like this, with red cubes representing their health and stamina. To take an action, place a red cube in the matching circle on your card. In this case, a melee attack. Because the symbol beside melee is an orange die, that is a die we will roll. Each character has a max number they can spend on any skill. In this case, four. An attack defeats an enemy minion if it has more successes than their defense, although the villain can spend stamina to roll defense dice. On the left, the skills are melee, ranged, manipulate, and thought. The latter two are used more for interacting with things like bombs in the scenario. Note that Batwoman gets yellow dice instead of orange dice for manipulate. To move, you place a cube in the bottom right. You get the cube spent plus a base starting amount of movement for each character shown here. Each map also has detailed instructions for how many levels up and down different spaces are, and moving up and down normally costs extra movement points. You can do a ranged attack to any adjacent space, or any space with a matching letter symbol to the space you are in. When all heroes have passed, the villain acts. First they recover stamina points, then they choose a card to activate. Its position is how much it costs, so six for these brutes, but one for Harley's gang. When a group is used, it goes to the end of the line. The villain activates two cards per turn. Activating a group allows you to move and attack with every figure in that group, and they have their own stat cards. Individual villains activate by themselves, and this card represents scenario events. If a hero is hit, they can spend cubes to roll dice in defense, and at any time, a hero can spend cubes to re-roll. Any unsoaked hits move a cube to the damage area. Finally, the heroes decide if they will rest and skip their next turn and regain a lot of stamina, or stay active and regain a little. Why would you like this game? Okay, let's get the really obvious stuff out of the way first. If you love Batman and miniatures, you'll really get a kick out of this game. There are so many character models in the game, it's crazy. Production values are off the charts and everything looks slick and polished. The maps are wonderful, and although there's only four of them, they do look gorgeous. The selection of heroes is wide and varied, and they all feel characterful and interesting to play. And the same is true of the massive rogues gallery in this game. The best thing about this game is the stamina system. It makes you feel heroic when you spend all your cubes to stomp the bad guys but that leaves you vulnerable to counterattacks. However, this is not a cheap game by any means and it takes up a huge amount of space. It's also quite hard to learn initially and keeping track of all the different skills the heroes and villains have is a challenge. And finally, the scenarios are good, but some people I played with really wanted a more open, pick your team and villain format for the game. This game is a reimagining of Conan by the same company and mechanically they share a lot in common. And the figures are comparable to a game like Zombicide. Batman Gotham City Chronicles. <laughs> Batman! Kyora, and welcome to Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig in about three minutes. Review copy used. It is a game for two to seven players. There is no solo mode. Playing times around 30 to 60 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. In this game, you will work with two other players seated to your left and right and collaborate with them to build the two best castles that you can. You will take turn placing rooms in each castle each turn until you run out of rooms to place. Different rooms will give you different bonuses, so choosing wisely where you place them will make a big difference to your final score. You will need to balance your castles and not focus on one too much, as the winner of this game is determined by who has the highest value amongst each player's lowest scoring castles. Competitive. While you're working to build castles for people, there is still only one winner. Tile placement. Set collection. Tiles work best when you collect groups of them. Player turn. You will start with a throne room and nine tiles. Select two tiles and pass the remainder to the player on your left. Of the two tiles you have selected, one must go in each castle to your left and right. Continue drawing tiles, selecting two and placing two until you only have one tile left which you discard. Then draw nine more tiles and repeat the process, this time passing to your right. Each type of room works differently and you gain a bonus when you place the third tile of the same room type in a castle. Some examples are living rooms, which gains a bonus point for every room matching the show and type adjacent to it. The bonus for three living rooms is to place one of the royal attendants in your throne room. This attendant gives you bonus points for every room with a matching symbol in its top right. Work rooms get extra points for each connected room of the matching type in a line. So two points for the ones on the right here, 
plus another one for the one on the left. The bonus for work rooms is to draw three objective cards and keep one. Outdoor rooms grant points for each room in your castle matching its chosen type, but cannot be built above. The three tile bonus for outdoor rooms is a fountain tile, and dungeons must be placed underground, and having three of them allows you to collect any other room type's bonus. There are also food rooms, bedrooms, and corridors. Knowing what each room does and how it scores is the key, so keep this reference card handy during the game. And finally, if you place a fifth tile of any type, you can add a monument tile, like a fountain or a tower, to your castle. Why would you like this game? Between Two Cities is one of my all-time favorite games, and I'm also quite fond of Castles of Mad King Ludwig. This hybrid game is more two cities than it is Mad King, and I think that was a good decision. The core gameplay is virtually identical to Between Two Cities, and the game still encourages that competitive collaboration with positive interactions which makes Two Cities shine. But this is also a deeper and more complex game than Between Two Cities. The elements imported from Mad King, such as room bonuses and the more variable layout, make it a more serious gamer's game. And that's where the game shines, with people who like Between Two Cities but want more to the game. The storage solutions for the game and how it packs away is some of the best I've seen. The best thing about this game is the wide selection of available tiles and the wonderful art on them. It's all very evocative and detailed. However, this game has a serious issue of how information is presented on tiles. While the art is great, the icons and words are very small, and I've had people struggle to read them up close, let alone looking over the table at other people's play areas. There are people I know who find this game almost unplayable for that reason, and the added complexity and depth comes at the cost of accessibility to new players. Obviously, the two games to compare and contrast us with are Between Two Cities and Castles of Mad King Ludwig, both of which I've covered on the channel. Between Two Castles, Between Two Cities, Advanced Edition. Hello and welcome to Block by Block, the Insurrection Game, Second Edition, in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around two hours. It's a reasonably complex game. It's a tense night in Block City. There's only so much the poor and downtrodden blocks can take before they say enough. It's time to hit the streets, to organize, to fight, and to risk control of the city back to the hands of the blocks. The cops are waiting, but are they ready for what's about to go down? At the start of the game, each player is dealt an objective. All social players win if two of them complete their objectives. You lose the game if the game timer ever runs out or if any one player is wiped off the board. Cooperative. The players are all different factions with the police as a common enemy. Area control. The city is made up of 25 districts and controlling these is the key to winning the game. Player turn. At the start of the game, you pick a faction to play. On your turn, you will roll three to five dice for actions, depending on how many blocks you have on the board. Basic actions can use any dice value and include movement. You can move a group of cubes to any space on the map, only stopping if you contact police. The prisoners decide to all move here. Combat requires you to use a die equal to or higher than the region's difficulty, in this case 5. You can defeat one police cube or kick two of them out of your space. The prisoners do so twice. Placing a barricade is another basic action. Looting is an advanced action and requires a dice equal or higher than the area's difficulty. Draw a loot card and make a reaction roll. In this case, a 1 is rolled and a cop is called. The workers then move into this area and place an occupation. This one allows them to draw loot cards by spinning any die. This also prompts a reaction roll. Finally, they use a loot card and the remaining action die to place extra barricades. The police move after each player's turn, and the number of cards they play is determined by police morale. The main way to reduce morale is to defeat police and riot vans. Riot vans are tough, requiring three hits to be defeated. Police movement is one card at a time. In this example, they first move into this commercial district, and then into the prison district. Cops currently in a clash with cubes don't move. Three strength barricades stop all cops, and then are removed. And weaker barricades stop some cops after all players have acted police attack removing one cube each although riot vans remove everything then if you have double the cubes of an area's difficulty you can liberate it claiming the powerful one-time manifestation card and flipping the area over finally check to see if you have won or lost the game otherwise it is the next turn why would you like this game? I love the first edition, and second edition only makes improvements. This game has been streamlined a little, and the factions now feel more distinct. The player mat is a massive improvement as well, making setup and play a lot easier to manage. And overall, the art and graphic design is much improved. And yet everything I loved about the original game is untouched. It is the game I would rather teach people to play than Pandemic, as it has a similar game space with much richer and more interesting decisions to make. The game captures the feel of rolling street fights, mass police action, 
and the chaos of an insurrection like nothing else. The best thing about this game is the theme. Flipping police vans and fighting cops is something rather unique in the world of board gaming. However, if you have a Blue Lives Matter bumper sticker, this game will not be for you. The cops are the bad guys, and exploitative capitalism is the enemy. This is a game with a strong and unsubtle political message. And I'd also say the optional non-social objectives may not be to everyone's liking, as they introduce a semi-cooperative element to the game. If cooperative games against injustice are what you're after, look no further than Freedom the Underground Railroad. And for another co-op experience, this time acting within the controlling power structure, check out Black Orchestra. Block by block, fight the powers that be. Kia ora koutou, and welcome to Call to Adventure in about 3 minutes. Review copy used. It is a game for 1-4 to four players. It has a solo mode using the adversary cards. Playing time's around 30 minutes. It's a reasonably simple game. Heroes come from many places. Beggars, merchants, nobles and squires. The call to adventure is really easy. A thirst for knowledge or a desire to right an ancient wrong. Will you become a shining paragon of virtue whose name is honoured across the realm? Or will stories be told of your tragic fate around the fire? You win? if at the end of the game you have the most points. You gain these from playing special cards, adventures you go on, and your character's morality score. You get extra points for collecting cards and sets. Competitive. Everyone is trying to tell the most epic story. Drafting. You select adventure cards from the face-up display. Rune casting. Casting runes will determine whether you succeed or fail. Player turn. At the start of the game, you'll be dealt six cards in three pairs. The first choice is your character's origin, which will determine your starting powers. The second is your motivation, which gives you another power, and the final one is your destiny, which is the goal you are striving for. You start in Act 1, and have the choice of selecting any of the face-up Act 1 cards. This one does not require a test for this character to claim, only an experience point. Note you can also spend experience to discard cards from the display and redraw. When you claim a card, you place it on your character board. Next turn, we try to claim a card that requires a test. This one requires four successes, and it uses the runes shown here. You always take the three basic runes, and add any other ones matching the test. In this case, two blue runes. We could also spend an experience to draw a dark rune up to three times, but that can have consequences to our character's morality. We cast the runes and get this result. The basic slash symbol is one success, and the special symbol counts as two. The final symbol allows us to draw a character card. We then claim the card and add it to our character. We can now use three blue runes, which is the maximum of one type and includes a special bonus rune. Cards can change your morality score. For example, this one lowers it. If your morality is high, you can only play hero cards. And if it's too low, you can only play anti-hero cards. Some cards have different difficulties. For example, this ally increases this card's difficulty by one. And to claim the bottom reward, you must increase its difficulty by one more. Once you have three cards from Act 1, you move on to Act 2. And the game ends once a player has three cards from Act 3. Why would you like this game? To put it as straight as I can, if you want a short game that tells a neat story, Call of Adventure will be for you. The morality system is simple, and the characters can be shining paragons or flawed anti-heroes. And that's reflected in the special cards they play, and the adventures they go on. The art is wonderful and evokes fantasy tropes without seeming cliched, and there's a great variety in the character stories you can tell. Rune casting is also lots of fun. The best thing about this game is the stories it tells. Our apprentice here, the sole survivor of a brutal attack that left her orphaned. She sought dark power and magics, and then led an expedition of refugees into the capital, took over a gang, and became a master criminal. Her destiny was vengeance. So she succumbed to the dark magic, harnessed the power of the living flame, and slew the archmage who had destroyed her village. However, the journey is far more important than the destination. Scoring the game almost seems an afterthought compared to the stories you can tell. People looking at this game solely for the gameplay will miss a lot of what makes the game special. And the grey runes really annoy me, as they are so hard to tell apart from the basic black ones. If you want a character creation game that's more mechanics heavy, try Roleplayer. Alternatively, you can also check out Vindication. Call to Adventure. Answer the call. Kia ora, and welcome to Chinatown in about 3 minutes. It is a game for 3-5 to five players. There is no solo mode. Playing time's around an hour. It's a pretty simple game. It's 1965 and the US government has enacted the Immigration and Nationality Act, which removed previous legal restrictions against immigration not from Western Europe. With newfound freedom to come to America, many came from Hong Kong and mainland China to Lower Manhattan, 
prosperous Chinese community already existed. You are the head of a family business looking to build a new life in the new world. Can you make the best deals and build the greatest business empire for your family? You win if at the end of six turns, you have the most money. Competitive. Only one family can be the richest in Chinatown. Trading. Shops, deeds, and money can all be traded and you will need to trade to win. Tiling. Tiles represent shops and you will need to place them to make money. Player turn. The core of Chinatown is the real-time trading phase in the middle of a round, but before you get there, you will need deeds and shops to trade. Check this reference sheet and cross-reference for turn number and player count. It's turn three, so we get five deeds and get to keep three of them. Here are our five deeds. The numbers represent spaces on the board we could own. 42 is first, but that's nowhere, so we decide to get rid of it. 45 is a prime spot, as we have a restaurant there and can likely sell those two spaces to black for a lot of money. Next is 51, which wouldn't be a bad choice to make, but we we also have 73 and 76 which create a linked up group of three plots. We also get three new shop tiles and add them to the ones we already have. Trading is next and we take a good look at the board. Red will want to complete this restaurant so we look for something Red has that we want and we see they have a florist tile in this area. We swap deeds, tiles and Red pays some money as well. All trades must be mutually agreed. Once all trades are done you place your shop tiles. Then you collect money based on this chart. Completed shops which are ones with a number of connected the tiles on the board matching the number in their top right earn more than incomplete shops. The most one shop can earn is $140,000. Then advance the turn marker and start the process over again. Why would you like this game? Chinatown is the kind of game that appeals to people who like making deals and heavy social interaction. The real time trading phase can get really noisy and chaotic and if you thrive in those environments you'll probably love this game. The game moves at great rapidity and the six turns are over in no time at all and there is very little downtime. Most actions are simultaneous so everyone can stay engaged. The board is also a depiction of the Manhattan Chinatown and little details like the parks and roads are a nice touch. The best thing about this game is how value evolves. Take this example. Yellow can sell this deed to either red or white for a huge amount but if next turn the board changes to this that deed is a lot less useful as red doesn't need it and white can also deal with green. However Chinatown is deeply rooted in stereotypes of Chinese businesses and families. Your shop options are things like laundries and takeout joints and if these kind of cliches make you uncomfortable this game won't be for you. And you can end up playing this game with someone who drags the game to a crawl, calculating each trade as though it's a formal legal transaction. If you end up in that space, add a time limit to the trade phase. For an even simpler trading game, you can try Pit, the venerable commodity trading game. And if you want something a lot more involved, check out Sidereal Confluence. Chinatown, fast, frantic fun. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Chocolate Factory in about three minutes. Review copy used. It is a game for one to four players. There is a solo mode. Playing times around an hour. It's a moderately complex game. Who can take a sunrise, sprinkle it with dew, cover it with chocolate and a miracle or two? Why you can. In Chocolate Factory you are a budding chocolate entrepreneur with ambitions to deliver the finest quality chocolates to the best department stores in town. Will you make the world taste good in this land of chocolate? Or are you actually making perky nanos and cherry ripes that no one in their right minds will eat? You win this game if you've made the most money at the end of the week. You get money from completing corner shop orders and from where you place at the end of the game on department stores. Competitive. Everyone is running their own chocolate factory. Drafting. Factory parts and skilled employees are in high demand. Engine building. Your factory gets progressively more powerful as the game goes on. Player turn. Get five factory parts and five employees. Allocate each into a number of piles matching the number of players. This is the setup for two players and this is for three. The first player chooses one pile and selects a card, discarding any other cards in that pile. Then pick in turn order and the last player picks twice, going backwards to the first player. After this, each player will have one employee and one factory part which they place in their factory. Your hired employee has a power you can use this turn. Each turn you get coal based on what day it is. Now you run your factory. Place one cocoa bean on the three tiles outside your factory, then push the first one into the factory. You can operate any machine in the factory on the tile adjacent to it. This machine costs one coal to run and it turns one cocoa into a chocolate. Then remove the coal used in that shift. Then move all tiles right one step. We run the first converter again, but the second tile has the option of using either the machine at the top or the bottom. As we have chocolate in the space and not a cocoa bean, we run the top converter, which stages a chocolate up one step. Here's the guide for staging up chocolate. 
chocolates. We then run the third and final shift of the day, repeating the process from before. But the chocolate in the third area leaves via a ramp and goes to our storeroom. Chocs in your storeroom can be used to fulfill orders for points, and when an order is complete, you gain a new one. You can also sell to the department store whose employee you hired. Anything left in your factory stays there, and you can save two chocolates in your storeroom. Additionally, at any time, you can convert chocolates in your storeroom into coal. Keep playing until the end of the week. Why would you like this game? Chocolate Factory is a game for people who like making engines and find converting one thing to another rewarding. It's all about building the perfect factory that takes raw materials and spits out amazing finished products that are in demand. And if that process of continuous improvement and refinement sounds enjoyable, then you will get a kick out of the game. There's also some pretty strong effects on the employee cards that you can make good use of. And overall, the art and presentation of the game is exceptional, and in particular the chocolate pieces are attention grabbing. People just love chocolate. Oh, and I really like this clever way they reuse some art assets. The best thing about this game is moving tiles through the factory. It's incredibly satisfying. However, player interaction is on the low side. Once your factory is running in the turn, the rest of the player's actions will disappear from your mind. And we found in a four player game, we had to run our factories one at a time, and some of the supplies would run out if we ran them all at the same time. For a similar but simpler game, check out Pay Dirt. And if you'd like converting raw materials into finished products and making money, try La Havre. Chocolate Factory. Now available in Essen, in Germany, the land of chocolate. Mmm, the land of chocolate. Hello and welcome to Circadian's First Light in about three minutes. Prototype copy used. Part of our ongoing program to promote New Zealand gaming. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is one to two hours. It's a reasonably complex game. Humanity is set out into the stars and you are a group of explorers known as Circadians. You have arrived at a new world, one full of intelligent and organized life. You are the visitors here, the strangers in a strange land, looking to work in partnership with the locals in order to build a successful outpost for humanity. The winner of this game is the player with the most successful research base at the end of eight turns. Your success is determined by victory points, which are represented by this symbol. Competitive. Only one player can win this game. Dice and worker placement. Dice your workers in this game, and placing them in locations will give you the associated benefits. Point salad. There are many ways to gain points in this game. Player turn. First reveal the event for this turn. It can be positive or negative. Then roll any dice you have in your base and behind the screen you assign them to either garages at the top, which take actions outside of your base, or to the farm section to take internal actions. Reveal your selections when all players have placed. External actions will cost you algae, as shown here, although the first external action is free. External actions include trading at the market, where you can swap the resources as many times as the dice value shown. The foundry, where you can buy upgrades for your garage by paying the cost shown. This upgrade allows you to boost the value of a die by up to two pips. The mining camp, where you can trade water for valuable crystals. The lab, where pairs of dice are used to buy upgrades for the farms in your research base. The academy, where you pay resources to collect extra dice. The depository, where you can buy equipment upgrades by permanently leaving a die behind and paying the associated costs. The control room, which allows you to move your harvester on the planetary map, claiming any resources you move across. And finally, trading with the locals, which permanently leaves a die in place. When you trade with the locals, you can get a special one-time benefit if you're the first to use that numbered die. However, if a die placement would trigger any of the effects at the bottom, the player taking that action must pay the associated cost instead. Then gather the resources shown under your harvester, collect any passive farm income, and then any active farm income. If it is not the final turn, reclaim your dice and keep playing. Otherwise, total up your points to see who won. Why would you like this game? Circadian's First Light is a busy game with a heck of a lot going on, but once you understand how all the locations work and their interactions, there is a lot of depth here. The eight different leaders all give significant and distinct advantages, which allows you to take different approaches to victory. And there are a lot of different items in game, which can be used in different ways. Some give discounts when taking actions, in-game advantages, victory points for certain conditions, or just a lot of points. This all combines to make a game where you can take dramatically different approaches to your opponents and and still be successful. The best thing about this game is while the values rolled on the dice do matter, there are so many mechanisms to manipulate them and so many locations to choose from that you are rarely cursing your rolls. However, the game starts with a draft of equipment cards, and skillfully matching those cards to your leader and deciding an early strategy can be hugely important. 
This means first time players will be at a serious disadvantage against veterans. A player can also get out to an early dominant position and there are not a lot of levers the other players can use to hold them back. The designer's previous game was Architects of the West Kingdom and this shares some traits in common with that. And if you're looking for a lighter, dice worker placement game, try Roll for the Galaxy. Circadian's First Light. Can anyone ever have too much algae? Kia ora koto, and welcome to Crimeopolis in about three minutes. Prototype copy used. Final version will look quite different. Part of our program to promote New Zealand gaming. It is a game for two to five players. There is no solo mode. Playing time's around 90 minutes. It's a reasonably simple game. It's 1920s in small town America. Prohibition is in effect, and the demand for illegal booze runs high. Taking inspiration from those big city mobsters like Al Capone, you decide to set up your own criminal enterprise. Will you become the boss of boss? or will you just end up burying all your friends? You win if at the end of the game you have the most points. When one player reaches 21 points, that is their last turn, but everyone else gets one more turn. Competitive. There is no friendship on the streets of Crimeopolis. Area control. Moving your gang around the city and taking over territory is the key to winning. Victory points. Points can be gained from missions, killing rival mobsters, fortune cards, and taking over and controlling regions. Player turn. At the start of the game, you build the city by placing your HQ and one tile each in turn. Each player gets seven time on their turn and actions cost time. If you do not spend all of your time in your turn, the next player gets that time added to theirs. You can spend two time to place a mobster on your HQ. The maximum number of mobsters in an area is normally three. You can spend one time to move a group of mobsters to a street area between the city zones. If you move to an area that is only one tile, pick one of the two revealed city tiles and place it for free. Some tiles have these arrows, which means they are double tiles. You cannot place a tile here that isn't also part of a double. You can also choose to place your safe house instead of one of the tiles. The safe house is a location where you can also recruit mobsters. You can ambush enemy mobsters in the streets, removing an equal number of your mobsters, and you can take over a location in the same way. Any mobsters removed this way increase your body count. Each player will have two job cards. To do a job you must be adjacent to the matching region and not currently occupying it. You then draw a headline card which may cause complications for your job. Spend the time noted on the card and move the number of mobsters shown into that region. Also, claim the victory points. You will always have two jobs, so as soon as you complete one, draw a replacement. If you ever have two jobs for the same location, you can immediately discard them both and redraw. You can also spend time to draw a fortune card. Some of these have powerful game-changing effects. Why would you like this game? Crimopolis is a brutal, unforgiving game where you can be smashed badly with little you can do about it, but smile and wear it. And if you're someone who likes that kind of brutal cutthroat game, this is definitely one to check out. The headline cards range from trivial to absolutely shattering as do the fortune cards so this is a game that thrives on chaos and sudden twists the city building is quite fun and the board gets quite expansive as the game goes on the flavor text on the job cards is really neat and i'm looking forward to see how this game gets fleshed out more during kickstarter as a lot of the art here is placeholder material the best thing about this game is the church and the tombstones it's something quite unique and watching those bodies pile up is both fascinating and terrifying however if you don't like conflict or unfairness in games this will not be for you you can be wiped off the the board and have to rebuild from scratch pretty easily and getting stuck with a mission that's hard to complete can be a hassle as it costs three times to discard a mission and draw a new one for a simpler game in the same vein check out family business and for another mob related game consider nothing personal crimeopolis the other valentine's day game kia ora and welcome to crisis in about three minutes review copy used it is a game for one to five players. There is a solo mode. Playing time's around two hours. It's a pretty complex game. Axia is in trouble. A series of poor decisions by the government and overseas problems have brought on a recession. Now the country is gripped by austerity and policies that are killing any chance of economic recovery. Can you build a financial empire that will lift Axia out of recession? Or will you crash the whole system and hope no one finds your offshore accounts? Crisis can go for seven turns, but each turn there is a goal that each player wants to achieve. This change is based on player counts and difficulty. Each point over that goal improves the economy, and each point under it weakens it. If the economy ever collapses, the game is over. The winner is the player with the most points when the game ends. Competitive. Only one entrepreneur can come out on top. Worker placement. You place your managers in different areas on the board and gain the associated benefits. Engine building. You want to build industries and hire workers that work well together. Player turn. Before each turn, play an event card. The deck you draw from is based on the current economy level. Then, based on player order, each player
player places one manager in turn in any available space. Most spaces can only hold one manager, but these big ones can hold any number. You do not get the spaces benefit when you place your manager. That happens in sequence once all managers are placed. This space gives a bonus card to the player and this one money. This place claims first player and this one second player plus a bonus card. Here you can get loans which give you money but reduce your score. This spot allows you to buy one resource without lowering your score. Here you can claim workers, either a temporary worker for one turn, an imported worker or one from the row below. The middle of the board has six building cards. You can claim one by paying its cost. This increases your score as well. Here you can import goods for money. Imports hurt the trade balance so lower your score. At the power plant you can trade money or resources for power. Once all those actions are resolved you activate your buildings and produce goods. Each building has a mandatory worker and may require resources to activate. You then produce the resources printed on the bottom right. Adding additional workers increases the building's production by the value shown on them. So here we produce five ore. You can only hold a limited amount of goods in your inventory as shown on this card. Once production is done you can sell your goods on the market. You can either fulfill one of the orders shown here gaining money and score or simply sell on the black market gaining double money but no score. If at any point you cannot pay for an action you'll be forced to take negative points. Finally adjust the economy based on the player's scores, refresh the buildings, workers and market and if you have three of these symbols on your buildings claim your fifth manager for the next turn. Why would you like this game? Crisis is a brutal game that rewards players who can push their resources to the absolute limit. You'll frequently have to place yourself in a bad position one turn in order to have a much stronger action later on. The friction with other players and the damage they can do to the economy is fascinating. Knowing that the game could end any time also adds to the tension. The resource tokens are as good as anything out there and the cards are in a lovely oversized format which I really like. There's a big variety of buildings but I think I prefer the building ideas in the mini expansion as they lean into the near future idea more with their names and art. The best thing about this game is the decision space. You have to optimize every action, manage your resources and plan turns in advance. Everything in this game is tight and you always feel challenged by the goal. However, this game punishes mistakes like few other. The cost of not being able to use a space is not just a wasted action, it's also negative points and that's brutal. This is definitely a game you need to play multiple times to really understand how it ebbs and flows. And those first few games will be really rough for some people. For a much simpler economy building game, check out Oaxaca. And for an even more cutthroat experience, try New Angeles. Crisis. Austerity economics, but fun. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Darwin's Choice in about three minutes. Review copy used. It is a game for two to six players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is around 30 minutes per player. It's a moderately complex game. Millions of years ago, in the primordial soup, life emerged. First in microscopic forms and then, over time, evolving into more complex and stable animals. Will the species you control survive and thrive in an ever-changing world, or are they stuck in an evolutionary dead end, like the dinosaurs, the dodo, and the monarchy? You win if at the end of four eras, you have the most Darwin points. You get Darwin points from having your animals survive and thrive. Competitive. Only one player can win the survival of the fittest. Card management. Animals are made up of cards. Snakes. This game has snakes in it. Player turn. You will start the game with 10 animal cards and will redraw to 10 at the start of each era. You can then mulligan, discarding all but one card and redrawing. Animal cards consist of bodies, heads, pairs of legs and individual legs, tails and wings. The minimum viable creature has a head and a body, but you can combine more features as long as they fit together. The game revolves around four to five different biomes depending on the player count. Biomes are where creatures live and what they have to adapt to. Each has a limited amount of veggies and meat available, as well as conditions that the animals have to adapt to. Each animal you control gets only one action per error. The first action is to create an animal. Place it on the board and it consumes one food per heart the animal is showing. The animal must also be able to survive in the current biome. After all actions are made, each surviving animal gains a Darwin point, and the animal with the most adaption gains two to three more depending on the biome. In the second era, a new animal arrives, taking the food this marlin would eat. So we choose the second possible action mutate and it becomes a herbivore instead. You can spend Darwin points to mutate a second time in the same era. Between each era an event is played and in the third era that makes it so there is not enough food to go around. So the piranha crocodile eats the kakapo rhino. Each era two of the biomes will change at random and in the fourth era this one does. The orca seal can no longer survive here so has to use the final main action to migrate to a different biome. At the end of each era compare the most advanced species from each biome and award points to the best adapted overall. Plan until the end of the fourth era 
and count up your Darwin points. Why would you like this game? Darwin's Choice is a little bit different and will be the kind of game that appeals to people who love chaos and competition. At its core, it's a simple game about matching cards into sets to fit the current biomes, but what makes it engaging are the changes the game forces on you. Biomes will change throughout the game, making you adapt or migrate your species in order to keep them alive. And in every era, there is an event which can dramatically alter the game for all players. And it's this uncertainty and upheaval that keeps you on your toes throughout the game. The best thing about this game is the Franken monsters you build. If the idea of a winged Arabian porcupine bison seal doesn't make you smile, you probably won't enjoy the game. However, with five biomes in play at higher player counts and each player having multiple animals on the board, this is a space eating game. It's also very easy to lose track of what's going on. And by default the game has trading, but we found no incentive to use it. I recommend playing with the optional trade board rules where there is a tableau of cards to trade from instead. Like the ideas of evolution but want something different? Try Evo. And if you want something much heavier, consider Dominant Species. Darwin's Choice. All hail the winged Arabian porcupine bison seal. Kyoto Koto, and welcome to Everdell in about three minutes. Review copy used. After the recap, we'll look at the Pearlbrook expansion as well. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time's around 90 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. The many critters of Everdell Forest are working together to build a community nestled beneath the massive branches of the ever tree. By accumulating twigs and pebbles and a nice supply of berries, you hope to attract the best and brightest of the woodland critters to your new township. Can you build the most wonderful little woodland town in all of Everdell? Or will you be simply a stopover point for the barge toads? You win if you have the most points when all players have finished playing through four seasons. Points come from a lot of sources. Just look for the golden circle. Competitive. Everyone is trying to build the best town in Everdell. Card drafting. You can play face-up cards from the meadow. Engine building. Cards work together to create combos. Player turn. You start the game with only two workers and a hand of cards. You will need to collect wood, pebbles, amber, and berries in order to play cards. On your turn, you will do one of two actions. Play a card or place a worker. When you place a worker, you take the benefits marked in that space. For example, two amber. If the space is a closed circle, only one worker can occupy it. If it is an open circle, any number of workers can occupy it. There are also four special locations that change each game. Only one worker can occupy each spot, and the second spot is for four player games only. You can play a card from your hand by paying the resources printed on it. Instead of playing cards from your hand, you can also play them from the meadow. And while this card normally costs two berries, we already have the farm in play, so we can play it for zero cost. Just place an occupied sign on the farm to show it has been used. Cards come in different types, some provide one-off benefits, ongoing production, benefits when you play other cards, worker placement locations that you or others can use, and bonus victory points. You can also place workers to claim event tokens once you have the right number of matching cards in your village. You can also use a worker to claim one of these major events if you meet their requirements. When you run out of actions the first time, reclaim your workers and take the spring worker. Then all production cards produce. Repeat this process in summer, but draw two cards from the meadow instead of producing, and then in autumn, you produce again. Also in autumn, you can place workers in these spots and discard cards for victory points. Once autumn is done, your game is over. But keep playing until everyone is finished. Why would you like this game? First of all, this game commands attention when you place it on the table. The tree and its bright colors and vibrant art are absolutely eye-catching. The resource tokens, cards, and everything else in the box are of the finest quality. But beneath the flash is the cold steel of a well-tuned and well-designed game. The timing of worker placements, the cards you select, and the interconnecting engines you can build all create a game with a lot of depth and thinking. And there are so many cards in the game that you won't see the same play patterns emerging each time. The best thing about this game is the meadow. Having publicly playable cards dramatically increases your options and adds tension between players. However, I personally find the major events a bit of an afterthought. They don't add a huge amount to the game aside from something more to think about, and the minor events aren't much better. And on first play, you won't know the distributions of cards in the deck, and some of them are less common than others. This can hamper your decision making if you're looking for certain combos. Like building engines but not cute critters? Try terraforming Mars. And if you do like cute critters, but want something a lot more ruthless, try Root. Everdell, the berries are squishy. Squish, squish. Squish, squish. But wait, there's more. 
I'll quickly run through the Pearlbrook expansion and what's in it. First of all, it adds a sideboard, representing the coastline of Everdell. Minor events are removed from the game, which is a good thing in my mind. They are replaced with these overlays, which have new worker placement locations. These locations have very high costs, but allow you to buy unique monuments, and the monuments are worth a lot of victory points. These monuments also cost pearls, which are an ultra rare resource with two victory points by themselves. But they can also be used to power a lot of the other new things in Pearlbrook. To get pearls, you need to take actions in the ocean, and for this you will need a frog ambassador. The expansion also adds four new meeple sets for players to choose from, of which the starlings are my favorite. Your froggy ambassador can take this action to discard two resources and two cards to get one pearl. Or if you meet the requirements of one of the other spaces, you can go there, claiming the pearl on the card and flipping it over. You can take the flipped action immediately if you meet its requirements or the next time you place there. Each of these spots is limited and each player only has one froggy ambassador. So you will only get a maximum of four of these actions per game. Pearls not only build monuments, they also interact with many of the new cards in the expansion. At the start of the game, you'll also get dealt two adornment cards, which cost pearls for you to place. And finally, there are signs to show if your open locations are available for use or not. If this seems like there's a hell of a lot going on in this expansion, that's true. I'd really only recommend it for people who are quite comfortable with the core game and want to step up in complexity and variety. But a lot of what it does is good. The monuments themselves are very striking and getting rid of the basic events, which I thought were one of the weak parts of the core game, was a good move. They also give you something to strive for as the game reaches its finale. There's not that many new cards for the main deck, and there's a lot more ways in this game to get more card draw. So we actually found ourselves cycling through the deck faster than you would in a regular game. But I think my favorite part of the expansion is the adornments, because you get them at the start of the game, and they have some pretty neat and powerful effects, and you can build a strategy around them. So my final call on Pearl Brook is that it's an excellent expansion, but it is a major overhaul of the game and makes it a lot harder to teach. It's very much one for the fans of the game, but if you are a big fan of Everdell, I absolutely recommend picking it up. Com. Hello and welcome to Firelight in about three minutes. It is a game for two to five players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is just under an hour. It's a pretty simple game. The space race is back on, and this time it's corporations seeking to explore the solar system. Can you procure the right components and crew for your spaceship in this competitive market? Or will you end up piloting a misshapen ship nowhere fast? You win if at the end of the game you have the most points. The game ends when the last mission in one of these rows is completed, and completing missions gets you points. You can also gain points by winning these special awards. Competitive, only one company can be the best. Secret orders, your bids for various components and missions are hidden. Tile placement, how you build your ship is important. Player turn, ultimately you are working towards completing these missions. To complete a mission, you need to meet or exceed the value shown on it. Dice represent engines, green life support, and purple science tokens. Although your crew can be expended for shortfalls in life support, you monster. You will start with a ship core and five bidding tokens. These are numbers zero through four. When it is your turn, you will place one token face down on the board to indicate what component you are bidding on. You can add a crew token to add plus one to your bid. You can also bid on locations and missions. Keep playing until all players have placed their five tokens. Then you reveal them. An unopposed bid results in a win. And in a competing bid, the winner is the player whose numerical value is higher. The loser gains a crew as compensation. Note that it is a total number value that counts not the number of tokens. The locations allow you to increase an engine's power, gain a science, three crew, or change your ship layout. Take the components you want. Some will require you to spend crew. Attach them to your ship in any way that leaves no blocked connectors. Components with this symbol will generate a science each turn. You can also bid on missions, the winner gaining the full victory points and any runner-ups getting half. Then restock the components area and roll the engine dice, playing the highest dice in the highest engine rating slot and working down. It is now the next turn. Why would you like this game? Farlight is a nice simple bidding game with a high level of player interaction. Not knowing what your opponents have placed can lead to bluffs and counter bluffs, and the best part of the turn is revealing those contested bids. There are a bunch of ship components in the game, and you'll have a lot of fun putting them together. And the missions are straightforward and use easy to understand icons. And overall, the game connects with its theme reasonably well. In general, this game is easy to teach and understand and would be good for families. It's also in a small box and at a lowish price point. The best thing about this game is building a big ship in order to fulfill one of the final missions in style. 
However, I have a hard time being too critical of Barlight as it does nothing that bad, but it also doesn't blow my socks off. It's an okay game that lacks a little bit of magic and I'm not entirely sure why. I'd play it again, but I'm in absolutely no rush to. Also, due to its low price point, some of the components are on the cheap and scarce side. If you like building ships with tiles, also check out Galaxy Trucker. And if you want space exploration, but a whole lot more complexity, try leaving Earth. Farlight. I have no strong feelings one way or the other. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Galilean Moons in about three minutes. Prototype copy used. Part of our ongoing program to promote New Zealand gaming. It is a game for one to four players. There is a solo mode. Playing times around an hour. It's a reasonably simple game. The four moons of Jupiter represent a unique opportunity for humanity. And you are one of several business ventures attempting to make bank off the lucrative Jovian gem mining industry. But this is a cutthroat business and open corporate warfare is being waged. Can you mine enough gems? Research advanced technologies, sack your opponent's bases while protecting your own, and hold on to vast regions of the four different moons? The game ends after the command deck has been reshuffled for a third time. The winner is the player with the most points, and you gain points for having bases on the moons, for bases you have destroyed, for technology cards, and for controlling each of the four moons. But the most lucrative source of points is gems, and you score them based on each set of unique gems you have. Competitive. Only one player can emerge victorious and become the true master of the Galilean moons. Card management. Actions in this game use this set of command cards. Area control. Taking and holding areas on the moons is the key to winning the game. Player turn. Each player has two main actions they can do on their turn, and any number of supplemental actions. You can use an action to draw cards, discarding down to four if you currently have more than four cards. You can then draw four cards, choosing from either the face-up display or from the deck. Another main action is to invade. For an empty region, this costs you one card matching the region's color. For populated regions, you need one additional card per enemy worker and two additional cards per base. Wild cards count as any region in this situation, and in all others. Bases removed are added to your victory Pile. You can mine a region using a matching card and gaining gems for each worker there. And the final main action is to reinforce a region using one card to add a second worker to a region you already control. Supplemental actions include gaining a technology card, they cost one gem per tech card you already have and gain you victory points, as well as a power you can use once per turn. If you ever control three regions in a row, you can place a base in the central region. And yes, that means if you control a whole moon, you gain bases in all regions. And finally, there is one last game play wrinkle. One sector on a random space is a wild sector and it counts as every card in the face-up display at any time. So while this means you can mine a wide variety of gems here, it also becomes very easy to invade. Play continues until the deck runs out a third time, then you play one more round and score points. Why would you like this game? Pure area control is not really my favorite mechanic, but this game solved a lot of issues I had with it. It's fast paced and moves happen very quickly. You can only stack two units per region and one base, so no region is ever totally safe. The multiple ways of scoring points, combined with the technology cards which alter your playstyle, encourages genuine emergent strategy. And there's some real clever design in this game, with the deck of command cards having the same number of each sector, but those sectors appearing on the board in vastly different numbers. Combined with the wild sector, this makes for a huge variety in how easy a sector is to take and hold each game. The best thing about this game is the variable setup. Random regions, different techs, and different combinations add huge replayability. However, like most area control games, it's mean. The path to victory requires you to stomp all over your opponents and to get stomped in return. If you do not enjoy conflict and confrontational game mechanics, this game is not for you. Oh, and this is a prototype version, so I'm curious to see how different it looks when it reaches production. In a lot of ways, this is a leaner, meaner area control game than, say, Mission Red Planet, which had a similar theme. And if you want area control, emergent playstyles, and multiple paths to victory, but want something much bigger, check out Lords of Hellas. Galilean Moons. Figaro Magnifico. Kia ora, and welcome to Gen 7 in about 3 minutes. It is a game for 3 to 4 players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is around 2 hours per session, with 7 sessions in a full campaign. It's a moderately complex game. It's another fine day on your generational ship, and you are just about to sit down for another dull meeting with the other department heads. Then an alarm sounds, and the ship's computer Karen speaks. Warning, oxygen containment in the habitat ring is failing. Five minutes until total depressurization. Supplemental, the vending machines in the rec room are currently offline. You spring into action and grab your tools. Those vending machines are your responsibility to maintain and you won't let the crew down. Each game will be a different mission with its own setup and goals. The decisions you make in each mission will determine how your story unfolds. You will also get points for completing tasks. The more points you get, the more stars you gain to spend on skills. Cooperative, everyone is working together to make the ship function. Competitive, but only one person 
person can be the top officer. Dice and worker placement. Dice represent your crew and you place them on the board to take actions. Narrative. This game has a huge amount of story content. Player turn. Each player will be in charge of one of four divisions on the ship. Each barracks has a place to store the components you need for ship tasks. A place for your crew. There are two slots for schemers, which are ongoing bonuses your barracks have. There are many things to work towards in this game, starting with the current missions plot. You will also have a barracks goal and two private goals to complete. There are also operations tasks to complete for points, and while that's all happening, the ship also has maintenance tasks. The labs in each division give you the basic resources you need. You can also donate some resources to the ship stores for points. Resources in ship stores can be spent on maintenance tasks. Then you have the different centers for each division. Each has two tasks. The first of all, the data center is to draw two data cards and keep one. These are powerful one-time effects you can play later. The manufacturing center allows you to draw two schemas and keep one. And the medical center allows you to reclaim a crew member from Cairo sleep. The second action for each area is to complete a matching operations task by spending the show on resources. You can get more tasks by holding a meeting and any players can choose to attend. Maintenance tasks require placing dice matching the symbols on them. There is also robotics which allows you to claim a robot dice and robot dice are very useful for some maintenance tasks as they can be used in the place of two dice if the d12 symbol is shown. Failure to do maintenance damages the ship which can lock down locations in all parts of that division. And finally when you place your officer a crossroads card is drawn. If triggered you will have a story decision to make. Why would you like this game? Gen 7 is like a legacy game that doesn't overstay its welcome and that can be replayed as you don't have to destroy anything. The game evolves as you play introducing new story elements and game systems. Without mentioning any spoilers the story can go in extremely different places based on your decisions. The core mechanics are simple enough and there is always an opportunity cost for taking an action. The game works best when you are playing it like a group of petty middle managers who are more concerned with their own department than the overall success of the ship. The best thing about this game is the emergent story elements. I had bonuses gaining chems from skills and schemers and a crossroads card triggered because of that. The crew staged an intervention for my hoarding of chems and my character's chem problem became a running part of the story for us. However there were some times when cards came up with rules that hadn't been introduced yet and that led to some confusion. Given the many narrative branches it's not surprising but still very frustrating. And if you play this game fully cooperatively I could see it getting really dull. Without the internal tension between competing players the game would lack a lot of drama. While the game shares the crossroads system with Dead of Winter the games are dramatically different in how they play. And for a shorter cooperative game about a spaceship in peril try The Captain is Dead. Gen 7 The Office In Space Kia ora, and welcome to Gridopolis in about 3 minutes. Review copy used. It is a game for 2-4 to four players. There's no solo mode. Playing time is around 15-30 to 30 minutes. It's a pretty simple game. Ever think Checkers was a fun game when you were a kid, but really thought what would take it to the next level would be if you combined it with Lego and made the game 3 dimensional? I'd honestly never thought of doing that, but I kind of wish I had. Anyway, the designers of Gridopolis did, so now you can grab your components, build a board, and get ready to capture everyone else's pieces. You win if you're the last player with pieces left in the game. Alternatively, you can play with the optional scoring rules where you gain points for capturing opponents' pieces and kings, and for your leftover pieces at the end of the game. Competitive. Only one player can win this game. Player elimination. If you lose your last piece, you're out of the game. Player turn. After setting up the board, either using a standard format or your own alternative, you get six playing pieces, two blocker tiles, two poles, and three landers. Each player will have a home area designated by colored markers. If your opponent makes it to your home zone, they upgrade a piece to a king. Place your pieces on and adjacent to your home area. Standard pieces cannot move backwards, but can move forwards or diagonally. You can also move up or down levels while moving. You can jump your own pieces as well, allowing you to move over them. There are also teleporters, and if you land on one of those, you can immediately move to another unoccupied teleporter. You capture pieces by jumping over them in a straight line. Here, purple jumps and captures a piece, and ends up being kinged in the process. Straight lines for captures can go in three dimensions, so the green at the bottom here can jump the purple in the middle and land at the top. Kings are the only pieces that can move back towards your start point. And yes, you can do multiple jumps to capture multiple pieces. But you can also do jumps that would take you off the board to cap, although this does eliminate your own piece as well. And instead of taking a move action, you can modify the board. First you can place blockers, which make a space impassable, but you can also add new pads to the board if you choose to. Keep playing until only one player has pieces, or the two remaining players have kings. Why would you like this game? This is an unusual game for me to cover and I picked it simply because it was different. I had a friend of mine who runs a school based games club test it with the kids there and they really enjoyed it. And this review copy will be going back to that school club permanently. And that's the forte for this game. 
being a cool combination of a toy and a basic abstract game that you can teach in minutes. The three-dimensional movement and capturing of pieces can be tricky at times, but it's also one of the ways the game sets itself apart and makes it a bit more cerebral. And when it's set up, it's colourful and demands attention. It's the sort of game you can't walk past without going, ooh, what's that? The best thing about this game is that it encourages you to make your own structures and to modify the rules, so you can make a bunch of different things and play with them. However, the setup time can be pretty lengthy, especially if you pack the game away in the box after playing. If you plan to play routinely, it's probably best to leave a standard board set up. And while it's checkers with lots of bells and whistles, it's still checkers at its core. This is no big complex war game or Euro. And for another simple abstract game you can play with a family, check out Santorini. Gridopolis. Spock approved. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Horrified in about 3 minutes. It's a game for 1-5 to five players. It has a solo mode. Playing time's around an hour. It's a pretty simple game. From the laboratory in the castle east, to the ancient crypts where Dracula feasts, the mummy came forth from its ancient abode with a cryptic puzzle that needs to be solved. The wolfman was there, the creature too and Big Scary Frank with his bride to woo. The Invisible Man was hanging around, and then the monsters together roamed into town. They did the mash. They did the monster mash. They had a village to smash. And you win if you manage to defeat all the monsters before the monster deck runs out or the terror track reaches the end. Cooperative. Everyone is working together to stop the monsters. Set collection. Items come in three different sets, which can be used to fight the monsters. Automa. The monsters are controlled by an AI deck of cards. Player turn. At the start of the game, select two to four monsters to fight. The more monsters, the harder the game. Each player will select a character. Most will have four actions and a special ability, but not all. On your turn, you can take many different actions, and you can take the same action multiple times. You can call a villager from a space next to you to your space. You can move to an adjacent space and can take any villagers with you. You can pick up all items in your current location, and you can trade items with another player in your space. If you escort a villager to their safe location, you get a reward card, and these can have powerful effects. You can take an action to make a monster vulnerable. In Dracula's case, this is smashing his coffins and requires you to be in the same location as one of those coffins where you spend 6 strength of red item tokens. Once a monster is vulnerable, you can defeat them. In Dracula's case, you must be in the same region as he is and spend 6 yellow item tokens. Once you have acted, turn over a monster card. First, add new items according to the number at the top of the card, then follow the invent instructions. Activate the monster shown. Here, the bride would move one, but is already in a space with a player, so she attacks, getting one hit and one special. A hero can discard an item to nullify a hit, or if they have no items to spend, or do not want to, they can go to the hospital, advancing the terror track by one. A special hit die does different things for each monster. The last icon on this card is the enraged monster. In this case, that's Dracula. He moves to the nearest villager or hero and attacks. Here he removes the villager and advances the terror track. It is now the next player's turn. Why would you like this game? There's a lot to love in Horrified, and I think it's going to be a very popular game with a lot of people. First of all, its core rules and systems are very simple. The game is family friendly, especially as the horror elements are so G-rated. But this game has challenge as well, and when fighting four monsters, it's exceptionally difficult. The monster deck is full of thematic events, the villagers are classic characters from the mythos, and the whole tone of the game is one of a loving homage. The best thing about this game is the different monsters and how they work. Each feels like a different challenge despite having very simple mechanics. And the different mix of monsters you play with can change up the game and add variety and replayability. However, like a lot of comparable co-ops, Alpha Gaming can ruin this game. One shouty player can easily dominate a play session of Horrified. Horrified fills a similar niche to Pandemic in terms of complexity and accessibility. And if you want another horror co-op that's even more challenging, try Ghost Stories. Horrified. It was a graveyard smash. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Imperial Assault in about 3 minutes. This review focuses on the campaign and not the skirmish mode. It is a game for 1-5 to five players. It has a solo mode using an app. Playing times around about 90 minutes per level. It's a moderately complex game. It is a period of civil war. Rebel spaceships striking from a hidden base have won their first victory against the evil Galactic Empire. You will command either a member of an elite rebel strike team or the endless armies of the Empire in a series of linked adventures. Which side will come out on top in this epic Star Wars adventure game? You'll be playing through a campaign which has story missions and a bunch of potential side missions from a deck you build. Each mission has its own victory conditions, but they normally require the rebels to complete certain goals in a number of turns without all becoming wounded. Teams. One player is the Empire 
and the others the rebels. Dice. Most actions are a result of dice. Narrative and character development. While you can play one-off games with the skirmish mode, most are linked stories where the characters gain skills and upgrades. Player turn. Find the mission you are on and the Imperial player sets up the board, and then reads the mission brief aloud. Turns will alternate between the Rebel players activating a hero and the Imperial player activating a group of models. Imperial units usually only move and attack. Each Rebel player has a specific character with their own stats and skills. On their activation, they can take two actions, including move a number of squares equal to their speed, attack an opponent using the dice shown on their weapon card. These symbols represent damage, but you can roll defense to prevent damage. The Royal Guard has a black defense die and its roll reduces the damage by two. The numbers on the dice represent accuracy. You can only hit a target as many spaces away as the numbers rolled on the dice. Dice also have surges on them that can activate special abilities. If we look at the weapon again, we can see you can spend a surge to do one extra damage. An Imperial model is not removed until it has taken its health and damage. If a hero takes more damage than their health, flip their character. They are now wounded. If this happens again, your character is removed from the board. Characters can also gain fatigue to power special abilities and move extra spaces. Depending on the mission, you can interact with some objects. Roll the relevant skill on your character and surges count as successes. Other actions include opening unlocked doors and getting item crates. The last action is to rest, which removes fatigue equal to your endurance score and health if that would take your fatigue past zero. At the end of the turn, the Imperial player gains threat, which they can use to spawn new opponents from one of the mission's spawn points. Play until one side wins the mission. Why would you like this game? Imperial Assault is easily the best way to tell a story about a group of heroes in Star Wars without having to run an entire role-playing game. The campaigns are not too long either, having enough content to tell a story but without a year-long commitment. The characters have very different playstyles, from a Wookiee who smashes things to a sneaky Bothan sniper. And each character has many ways to be upgraded, from item crates to equipment and skills, and some equipment can even be further modded. An Imperial player also gets upgrades, and can choose what to include in their force. Oh, and the core box comes with this. The best thing about this game is it allows you to play your own Star Wars epic, where great cinematic moments can happen. However, if you feel you are someone who needs to own all the expansions for a game, be warned, this game has expansions coming out of its ears. The one versus all gameplay also pushes a lot of responsibility for the game onto one player. So make sure whoever's playing the Imperials is up to it. Like the rules but hate Star Wars? Check out Descent 2nd Edition. And if you want a Star Wars adventure in one sitting, check out The Outer Rim. Imperial Assault, it's HeroQuest in space! Hello and welcome to Leaving Earth, in about three minutes. It is a game for one to five players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around two hours, depending on your math. It's a pretty complex game. Newsflash 1956. The space race is underway. Different nations are competing to become the first to get into space, survey new worlds, and discover the other mysteries of our solar system. Can you manage your nation's finances? Deal with uncertain rocket technology and beat the damned Ruskies to the moon. The game is played over a number of turns, each representing a year, and ends in 1976. The winner of the game is the player with the most points when the game ends. Competitive. Only one space program can be acclaimed the world's greatest. Push your luck. Untested rockets have a tendency to explode. Do you risk it all or spend money and time testing? Player turn. At the start of the game, pick a nation. Take their five ship tokens and collect 25 bucks. This amount will be your income every single turn and you can't keep money between turns. Deal out the objectives for the game. Some will be easy, like deploying the first satellite into space. Others will be much harder, like returning a sample from Mars to Earth. Let's use the Lunar Survey as a sample mission. The easiest way to do this is to send a probe into the Lunar Flyby area. Note that each area has a number, showing how difficult each move is to do. Moving from Earth to a Lunar Flyby is difficulty 1. Getting from Earth to Orbit is difficulty 8. You have to plan your missions, and it's best to do this in reverse. Objects have mass, as shown in the top left of the card. We need the probe and a rocket to move it. The rocket provides four thrust, as shown at the bottom right. To do the move needed, you need thrust equal to the mass moved times the move's difficulty. So two mass and one difficulty means the four thrust is enough. But first we need to get to orbit, and that needs a much bigger rocket. Your ID card has a table of shortcuts on it. We cross-reference difficulty eight and see a Soyuz rocket can put one mass into orbit so we need two for this move but first we need to buy the technologies needed for these rockets and surveying 
Each technology starts with three outcomes on them that you draw when they are used. If you launch the mission and drew this outcome, the whole ship would explode. You can pay five bucks to remove this card after its effects resolve. But as long as there are at least two cards left, you have to randomly pick one each time it is used until either no cards remain or the last one is a success. So now we've tested our tech, we fire our Soyuz rockets and reach orbit, then our Juno to reach the lunar flyby. And finally, we use surveying to reveal the moon and claim the VP card. More complex missions will require much more planning. Why would you like this game? This game is clearly a passion project for the designer and it shows. The game captures the feeling of running a space program with the long-term planning and risk management that entails. There are dozens of different missions you can use in the game that will change it up, as well as different technologies and pieces of equipment. And finding the best way to do missions using these technologies is the core of the game. And if you get tired of exploring the inner planets, the expansion adds the rest of the solar system for a truly epic game. It's great for groups, but just as solid solo. The best thing about this game is seeing someone testing to do a mission and then jumping the gun ahead of them and hoping your untested technology works. However, the game comes with a fair bit of mathematics required. And while the reference sheets help, the ability to do basic arithmetic very quickly is huge. If totaling up numbers sounds more like punishment than fun, this game won't be for you. And some turns in the game will be very different lengths, like buying a Saturn rocket for 15 bucks and testing it while your opponent plots a complex mission. And this is a homemade game. Supply can be patchy and you won't find it in many stores. If you like the idea of leaving Earth but want something far simpler, check out Farlight. And if our solar system isn't enough, check out Expedition Zeta. Leaving Earth, it's above and beyond. Kia ora, and welcome to Legendary Encounters, an alien deck building game in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around an hour. It's a moderately complex game. The damn company has pulled you out of hypersleep and redirected the ship to some unknown rock. You found a shipwreck full of eggs and one hatched and latched onto Kane. You thought he was fine until dinner that evening when a thing burst out of his chest. And now it's loose on the ship and you're determined to take action. Time to crawl into the air vents and find this thing. Hopefully Parker, Lambert and Ripley have your back. Each game will have three objective cards. You need to complete the goals listed on each of them one at a time to win. Cooperative. Everyone is working together to stop the xenomorph threat. Deck building. You start the game with a set of basic cards and add more powerful cards to it as you progress through the game. Player turn. Each player selects an avatar, takes the associated special card, seven specialist cards which have one star on them, and five grunts which have one slash on them. This is your starting deck. You will draw six cards to form your hand. Before you act, a new card is added from the hive deck into the complex. This pushes all cards left one space. If there is a gap however, cards only get pushed into that gap and no further. Stars are primarily used to buy cards from the HQ. The five specialists here give us five stars. The cost to buy a card is the number in gold on their bottom right. We choose to buy teams of three, placing it and the specialists in our discard pile. We then draw a replacement card for the HQ. Slashes can be used to scan cards in the complex at the cost printed on the mat, turning them face up. We scan the med lab and reveal a noxious xenomorph, which needs four slashes to kill it. Fortunately, we have four more in our hand and play them to remove move it. Many cards will have bonuses listed that will trigger if you play a certain card beforehand. This sequence grants two stars, eight slashes, and a drawn card, and a new one added to your deck. If a card is pushed off the end of the complex, it ends up in the combat zone and will attack at the end of each player's turn. You draw a strike card and resolve it. Take too much damage and you are eliminated. The complex can also contain events, objectives, hazards, and other cards. Events have different effects based on which objective you are currently on, and hazards do different things based on your location and how many hazards have already been drawn. There are also coordinate cards which you can play to help other players during their turn. Keep playing until you die or the third objective is complete. Why would you like this game? Alien is a very solidly built cooperative deck builder that is massively bolstered by its theme. You can play the game in movie mode where you play the three objectives for each movie in the appropriate location with the characters from the film or you can completely change that up and make your own alien film using any combination of objectives and locations. Heck, you can play aliens with the cast of that film or swap them out for four different versions of Ripley. This makes the game feel both true to the source material while still allowing you the freedom to shake it up as a game. The way combos in the game work encourages players to specialize, but the coordinate cards allow for teamwork. These two factors are really important for a co-op deck builder for me. The best thing about this game is the inherent tension of the complex cards being face down and having to scan them. Each reveal is tense and that adds so much over the course of a game. However, there are some mechanical oddities in the game. I wish grunts and specialists were called attack and plan and represented your avatar 
Scar's individual action rather than Colonial Marines, and the strike deck can be really swingy. Sometimes you can get hit three times and take no damage, while others you can get hit once and die almost immediately. The same holds true for a badly timed facehugger. As well as the other Legendary Encounters games, if you like the idea of co-op deck builders, also check out Aeon's End. Alien Legendary. In space, no one can hear you shuffle. It Kia ora koutou and welcome to Magnate in about 3 minutes. Prototype copy used. It's a game for 1 to 5 players. It has a solo mode. Playing time's around 2 hours. It's a pretty complex game. You are a property developer out to make profit off a local property boom. You will buy land, develop it, market for new tenants and then flick it off when the time is right. Can you exploit the market well enough to make massive profits before the bubble bursts and the economy collapses? You win if you have the most money at the end of the game. The game ends when the crash marker reaches the land price marker. Competitive only one player can survive the market crash with the most money to win. Push your luck. Prices keep rising until they crash. Dice. Attracting tenants requires successful dice rolls. Player turn. At the start of the turn, each player bids to be first player. You then attract tenants and collect rent, but that doesn't happen on the first turn. Each player has three actions, starting with the first player taking one action and moving around the table. The possible actions are as follows. Consult to collect money equal to the current land price. Buy a plot of land marked for sale paying the current land price. Replace the for sale marker with one of your company logos. You can also buy a plot not marked for sale if it is a adjacent to one you already have, but that costs you double. Here is a list of buildings in Magnate. You can build a property on land you own, paying the cost of the building on the chart. Place the building on the land and put your control marker on it. You can rebuild a building to a new type of building, paying the new building's cost. You can sell a building. It goes for a multiple of a land price based on the number of occupants and other factors. This can be referenced on the sale chart. Late game sales can go for over 20 million. Once a building is sold, it cannot be repurchased. The final action is to get advertising tokens. You can get two for free and pay 500k for each additional one. This brings us back to tenanting. For each building you want to tenant, check this chart. You'll roll dice based on the number of existing population of the required types in adjacent regions. The central region is always adjacent. There are also other bonuses from nearby tenants and features. To tenant a house you need only a pair of fives or better, but an office needs four fives or better, and advertising tokens can be spent as fives. Add the tenants to the building, then collect rents from all your buildings. At the end of the turn, the market face happens. Check if any tenant types are run out, what the current land price is, how much advertising was done, and how many properties were sold. Draw risk cards and adjust the risk track and land price based on what the market board says. Then draw new tenants and add them to the stack and add new properties for sale on the board. These numbers are based on the player count. When the crash happens, reveal all risk cards from the game to date and move the land price down as shown. Then all players sell any remaining property for a final cash out. Why would you like this game? Magnate is the first game I've played that captures the feeling of a speculative property bubble well. Players will ride the wave of increasing profits as each turn sets new record sale prices. But buildings you hold after the crash are worth next to nothing. There's a lot of different strategies to employ as well. Do you go hard buying land early on and develop it later? Or do you focus on flipping one property a turn? But the ever-changing board state will ensure that any strategy you pick will have to be adaptive. And for a prototype, this game looks very well presented. The buildings are neat and the sense of achievement from having a built-up city at the end of the game is real. The best thing about this game is that the market crash is controlled by player actions. The more aggressively you market and flip land, the quicker the crash comes. However, the calculations for tenanting can be time consuming. Counting up all the different tenants in the adjacent regions gets longer and longer as the game goes on. This can take people out of the moment just as the game is heating up. And despite Magnate's message about speculative bubbles, this is still a game about exploitative capitalism, which won't be for everyone. Like Monopoly before it, Magnate tells a story about runaway greed in the property market. And also like Monopoly, this message will be lost on many. And for a faster paced, simpler game about buying property and speculating, check out out Chinatown. Magnate, Pirates of the Inner City. Hello and welcome to Mint Delivery in about three minutes. It is a game for one to five players. There is a solo mode. Playing time is under 30 minutes. It's a pretty simple game. The city of Minttopia is headquarters to the world's greatest mint manufacturing business. You're one of the company's drivers, picking up orders and delivering them around the countryside. Will you be employee of the month? Or have you spent too much time snacking on your inventory? You win if at the end of the game you have fulfilled the most stars worth of mint delivery orders. The game ends if two cities order cards run out or if all four order draw piles are empty. Competitive. Only one player can be the Mint Delivery Employee of the Month. Pick up and deliver. 
delivering shipments of mints is how you score points. Player turn. This game is all about completing orders for points. Each order card has a destination at the top, the mints required to fulfill the order in the middle, and its victory points at the bottom. Each turn you will have two actions, and you can take the same action twice. Move allows you to move your delivery van one space on the map. While at a factory space, you can convert normal mints into colored mints. Three whites convert to a red, and two whites convert to a green. You can also take an action to restock on mints. In the middle, that is up to four, but the other factories, it is only two at a time. Fulfilling an order is a free action and must be completed at the matching city. Spend the mints and place the order card down for victory points. You can also pick up an order as an action taking it to your hand. Place one white mint on the order you did not take. If you can complete an order you just picked up immediately you can do that as a free action. Over the next few turns we pick up another order, drive to the east warehouse, load up on mints, convert them to green mints and then get ready to deliver them to the cinnamon center. This game can also be played with optional skills. Three are chosen at the start of the game, and once you complete a matching number of orders, you can choose a skill from the middle to have. Skills are not exclusive. Mark that you have the skill with some of the matching tokens. There are also optional terrain tokens, which you can place on the map. These include traffic jams, toll booths, and tunnels back to the factory. Play proceeds until an end game condition is met, and then finishes with a player to the right of the starting player. Why would you like this game? I have a soft spot for small box games, and mint delivery comes in a tiny box. I normally compare box size to mint works in these videos, but that's a bit pointless here. So here's above and below a regular sized board game. This game is very simple, fast moving, and easy to teach. As such, it's a great filler game, and very accessible to younger players. I think this game is ideal as a travel game, one you take on holiday to keep the family occupied or in your bag in case you end up waiting somewhere. There's also a complete solo game using the reverse side of the map that pits you against an AI opponent. The best thing about this game is its portability. You can take the game anywhere and everywhere. However, Mint Delivery is a small box game and I feel small box games need to be judged a little differently. If you pick this up expecting a deep and intricate design, you will be disappointed. It's a very simple game. A casual and family friendly game, but not the sort of serious gamers game that will have pages and pages of strategy guides written about it. Mint Works is the other game in the Mint series that focuses on worker placement instead of pick up and deliver. And if you want a much more complex pick up and deliver game, try Wasteland Delivery Service. Mint Delivery, fast and fresh. Kia ora koutou and welcome to museum in about 3 minutes. It is a game for 2-4 to four players. There is no solo mode. Playing time's around 20 minutes per player. It's a moderately complex game. Dateline 1900 and the great imperial powers are busy collecting the treasures of the world to house in their great museums. All over the world, western archaeologists are uncovering relics and artifacts in faraway lands in order to bring them home to entertain an adoring public. You are the curator of one of these museums, riding the wave of growing public interest in the world. Can you build the greatest collection of relics of the world? or will public opinion turn against you, branding you as nothing more than a tomb robber? You win if you have the most points at the end of the game. The game ends the turn after one player passes 50 points. Points are earned from having collections of objects, completing secret goals, and filling your museum. And you lose points due to negative public opinion. Competitive, only one player can have the most prestigious museum. Drafting, each turn you will gain new objects from the board. Set collection, objects earn more points when collected in sets. Player turn. Each turn is split into two main phases, the exploration phase and the action phase. In the exploration phase, you can get new objects to add to your hand. There are two objects for each region available, and the active player must select one to keep. Each other player can then select an object in turn or pass, and for each player that selected an object, the active player gets one prestige token. Next comes the action phase, which is only for the active player. The most common action to take is a furbish action, which allows you to add objects to your museum. Each object has a value shown in its top left corner. To put an object in your museum, you must discard cards of equal or greater value. You can also spend prestige. You can add as many objects to your collection as you can afford. You can also add cards to your museum from your discard, and other players can add cards from your discard to their museum by paying the cost to your discard and giving you one prestige. They can only do that on their action turn. The other main action is to refill your hand from your discard pile to seven cards. For each object you place in your museum, advance your score marker. When you pass one of these markers, Markers, collect the favor card. They are cards you can play in your turn for powerful bonuses. You can also recruit experts, paying their cost and adding them to your museum. And finally, you can arrange your collections. To score the most points, your collections need to be lined up well. Here they are not, but if we move them around, the Celtic cards are all together. The Navigation Domain cards are together and the Warfare cards are together, creating three distinct collections. After you are done, replace the drafted cards and if any are public opinion cards, add a public opinion marker to that region. Cards in your 
discard at the end of the game from this region will lose you points. And at the beginning of the first player's turn, draw a headline card and resolve its effects. Why would you like this game? The core gameplay of Museum is really straightforward. Draft cards and build collections. And that makes it a game that's really easy to teach. But it's also really satisfying to build a collection up, to snap up an object you need from someone else's discards, and there's a genuine sense of completion. There's also a bit more interaction than some other set collection games due to the ability to go after people's discard piles. The collection goals give you a good stare from the start of the game, and the favor cards give the game a shake up from time to time. The best thing about this game is the art. It's just stunning from top to bottom. This is one of my favorite games in terms of overall presentation. It's just wonderful. However, the taking of cultural treasures, or taonga, from around the world into colonial powers museums is a troubling topic for many. So if you find that a sensitive topic, this game might not be for you. And we also found some combinations of secret objectives were exceptionally powerful together. We ruled that you can't keep two objectives solely focused on the same civilization. You want to build a collection but book some more your thing? Try Ex Libris. And if you like history and set collection, there's also Seven Wonders. Museum, an artwork in my personal collection. Hello and welcome to Nemo's War in about three minutes. Technically it's a game for one to four players, but I'm only focusing on the solo mode. Playing time is around two hours. It's a pretty complex game. It's 1870 and the world is deep in the industrial and colonial age. Captain Nemo, the legendary inventor and deep sea explorer, has other ideas about the future. Will you guide Captain Nemo on a quest for great scientific discovery or wage war against the colonial powers? At the start of the game you will build a deck of event cards. You win once you reach the finale card and resolve it. Your final score is based on Nemo's motivation and that determines how well you have done. You lose if any ship resource reaches zero or if you need to place a ship and all oceans are full or the notoriety track gets too high. Narrative. This game has a lot of story elements. Push your luck. Taking risks when rolling dice are the key to this game. Tile placement. Where you place ships is very important. Player turn. Each turn starts with drawing a card. These can be one-off events, cards you can keep, tests you have to make with dice, or acts that advance the game. The core mechanic in this game is rolling 2d6 and adding modifiers, mostly from risking ship resources. This card is difficulty 9 and allows you to risk Nemo and crew resources to add plus 2 each to the roll. If you pass, you get to keep the resources you gambled, but if you fail, you lose them. There are some other ways to modify the dice after you've rolled, but they are scarce. Next you roll 2d6 and get a number of action points equal to the difference between the dice. If you roll doubles, it's a lull turn and you can only spend action points you have saved, but many actions are cheaper. Then place hidden ship markers in the oceans matching the dice rolled. If an ocean is full, you can place in an adjacent ocean, and if all spaces are full, replace a hidden ship marker with a ship token from the bag. You can attack a ship, either with stealth or directly. Warships get to attack you first and can do damage to the Nautilus. Then you get to attack them back. Sunk ships can be claimed as salvage or added to the tonnage track for victory points. Sinking ships can increase your notoriety, and as that goes up, more dangerous ships can be added to the ship bag. Here are some of the other actions you can take. Search to get treasure tokens. Rest and repair to recover spent resources. Refit to use salvage to buy upgrades for the Nautilus. In sight to reduce notoriety and place uprisings. Adventure, to turn over an adventure card and choose if you encounter it or not. And finally, to move the Nautilus to another ocean. You don't have to spend all your action points each turn. Why would you like this game? Nemo's War is designed from the ground up as a solitaire experience and it shows. It feels like a solo game for solo players and I love that. There are a lot of adventure cards to encounter in the game with unique illustrations and flavor text and many ways to refit the Nautilus. There are also so many unique ships which makes the world feel very real and the game's tension constantly ramps up as each new chapter adds more ships and dice per turn. The core gameplay is very satisfying and knowing when not to risk a resource on a roll or how to manage your scarce dice manipulation resources is huge. The best thing about this game is the different motivations and how they change scoring. Playing Nemo the Explorer is a very different experience to playing Nemo at war. However, this game is deceptively deep and complex and understanding how ship placement works and how to utilize it to your advantage will likely take a few plays to get to grips with. Until then, you can easily be overwhelmed in the third act by the ship's spawn rate. The game is listed as one to four players, but the co-op mode seems very tacked on. Nemo's War is pretty unique, but if you want to get into solar gaming and want something a lot simpler, try Hostage Negotiator. And if you want something even heavier, check out Coman Shirea. Nemo's War, 20,000 thumbs up. If Kyoto Koto and welcome to Noctiluca in about three minutes. Part of our program to promote New Zealand gaming. It is a game for one to four players. The solo mode uses the reverse side of the board. Playing time's around 30 minutes. It's a reasonably simple game. I'd like to be under the 
Noctiluca are a form of simple marine life, similar to plankton, that exhibit bioluminescence, which means they glow. You are one of a team of divers collecting the Noctiluca. Can you fill your jars with them while diving in the ocean, or will you just be paddling about in confusion? You win if at the end of two full rounds you have the most points. You get points from completing jars and having collected colored dice that match your secret objective. Competitive. Only one player can get the most points at the end of the game. Set collection. You need to collect sets of dice to fill jars and sets of jars to score big points. Player turn. At the start of the game, hand out a number of pawns based on the player count. There will always be 12 pawns in a game. Each player also has a reference card which shows which colored dice they want to collect for their secret objective. Each turn you are trying to collect dice and add them to your jars. Dice can only go on spaces with matching colors. When all spaces on a jar are full, collect the top token from the matching victory point pile. Place a used dice in the box lid and draw a replacement jar from one of the face up piles. Now how do you get these dice to place? When it is your turn you get to place a pawn. You can place it in any of the 12 areas around the board that are not currently occupied. You then choose a straight line from your pawn and select a number. For example, we choose this direction and 5. We would then claim all 5s from those 3 spaces. Alternatively, we could go the other way, selecting 1, which would give us these 5 dice. Take all dice selected and place them in your jars. If you cannot place a die, it goes to the next player and they can place it. Play continues until all 12 pawns have been placed. Once this happens, you clear the board. Refill the board with new dice and the direction of play changes, with the last player from the first round being the first player in the second round. When the second round is over, the game ends. Why would you like this game? Noctiluca is one of those deceptive games that looks like it will be a breezy fun, lightweight, jolly old time. But really, it's an intense brain melting puzzle where you constantly second guess yourself about what action to take. And actions are so limited in the game. Every single move feels important. I like that the game is only two rounds long and that the player order reverses. This ensures that there is no discernible advantage in who goes first or last. The game also has nice board presence with the brightly colored dice. The best thing about this game is the brain burning action selection. Trying to get the exact dice you want without giving any away is intense and made my brain fritz out at times. However, this game is rough when it comes to analysis paralysis. You can stare at the dice for minutes wondering about the best placement. Really slow players will slow the game down even more. And I don't like how you have to chuck the dice in the box lid. This game should have come with a dice bag, so I got one for it. If dice and puzzles are your thing, consider checking out Sagrada as well. And for a completely different game from the same designer, try Raiders of the North Sea. Noctiluca! Now if I place here and I get a 3 and I go along there I'm going to get 4 of those but if I go here and I get a 5 I'll probably get 3 of those but that's going to give 1 to that guy. If I place here I'll get a 2 and ah 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 ah. Kia ora and welcome to Obsession in about 3 minutes. Review copy used. It is a game for 1 to 4 players. There is a solo mode. Playing time is 60 to 90 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. It's Victorian England and your family estate is in terrible shape and you simply must brighten the place up so your family can reclaim their place in polite society. Your son and daughter are of age so a suitable match must be found for them and rumours have it that the most influential family in all of Derbyshire has heirs of an appropriate age. Can your family improve its station to the point where a match is simple? logical? Or will those accursed Yorks get in your way? The game ends after the final courtship phase. You win if at the end of the game you have the most victory points. Competitive. Only one family can be the best. Victory points. There are many ways to score points in this game. Card management. Managing your friends and family is the key to winning. Player turn. The game has regular turns and courtship turns. Before the first regular turn, a theme card will be turned face up. And during the courtship round, whoever has the most victory points in the matching category will have one of the Fairchild children visit until the next courtship phase. The final courtship is won by whoever has the most points in all of the theme cards revealed during the game. On a regular turn, you will select one of your tiles and place it in the activity space. Each activity has a number of cards you must play, a benefit, and a mandatory worker who must prepare the activity. For this activity, you play two gentry from your hand. Some will require additional servants to attend to their needs. You also gain the benefits from each card played. All workers used go to the expended service area and will be unavailable for a few turns. Cards played go to your discard pile. 
The activity is returned, but it is flipped over to its more prestigious side. Reputation is represented by the lion symbol. This event grants you three, so you advance your marker three spaces around the clock. If you would ever advance back to one, increase your full reputation by one point. During your turn, you can buy one improvement tile, paying the cost shown. Place it on the matching row in your estate. Activities and guests can only be used if your reputation equals or exceeds their own. There are two types of guests, regular guests and prestige guests. Prestige guests will have powerful abilities but require high reputation. And regular guests can also include unsavory characters. You can forego your turn to collect your discards back into your hand, and at this point you may choose to remove all tiles from the market and replace them with new ones. There are also objective cards you can claim for bonus points, victory cards which can be saved for points or used at any time, and finally, you can spend reputation to take the special actions listed here. Why would you like this game? If you are a Jane Austen or Victorian period fan, you will adore this game. It captures the feeling of the period exceptionally well, and you will feel like you are managing a household. The servant meeples are fantastic. I love how each of them has a role and is unique, and there's a bunch of different activities and the nicest tile bag I've ever seen. The choice of period appropriate photos for the art on the cards is excellent and the flavor text on the characters really brings them to life such as this unsavory character who is shockingly an american but if you dig beneath the theme there is a really solid game here you have very few actions in the game and you absolutely have to maximize them and that includes taking advantage of the special turns in the game like the national holiday where reputation doesn't factor into what cards you can play the best thing about this game aside from the theme is this chart on the back of the rule book i wish more games would give you a guide on how the game is actually scored. However, this is still very much a medium heavy Euro game, and if you don't enjoy those sorts of games, the theme might not be enough to overcome that. And if the Victorian period is problematic for you, this is certainly one to avoid. Gender roles are baked into the game, and every character is white. For a much lighter game in this period, check out Marrying Mr. Darcy. And for another game about noble families in Europe, consider Legacy. Obsession. Milady, the Dowager Countess has arrived. Hello and welcome to Paladins of the West Kingdom in about three minutes. Prototype copy used. Part of our program to promote New Zealand gaming. It's a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around two hours. It's a pretty complex game. The city and cathedral have been built in the West Kingdom, but the outlying lands are in peril. You're one of the paladin orders of the West Kingdom. Can you bring order to the land, build defenses, defeat invaders, and promote your faith within the realm? The winner is the player with the most points at the end of seven turns. Point salad. Anything with this symbol on it gains you points. Competitive. Only one paladin order can be the greatest. Worker placement. Placing workers in locations gains you the associated benefits. Player turn. At the start of your turn, deal three paladins from your deck. There will also be tavern cards available. You will place one paladin at the bottom of your deck, one on top, and keep one. Then gain the workers shown on that night. You will also claim a tavern card, gaining those workers as well. Purple workers are rogues and can be used in any location, but each gives you a suspicion card and potentially some tax. When the tax runs out, the players with the most suspicion gain a debt and a tax stall is restocked. On your turn, you will use one location. Let's look at the left side first. If a worker spot is colored, you must use a matching worker or a purple one. Develop costs 4 silver and lets you place a workshop on an action on the right. This means commission now needs only 2 workers to use instead of 3. Hunt and trade gain basic resources. You gain 1 for placing 1 worker and 3 for placing both. Note that our knight's special ability boosts trade. Conspire lets you gain a purple worker and the associated suspicion. Recruit allows you to either discard townsfolk or recruit them. Discarding gives you this bonus immediately while recruiting has an ongoing benefit. Prey allows you to remove workers from a spot, allowing a second use. The right side of the board has more complex actions. These require the attribute on the left and boost the attribute on the right. Attributes are tracked here. The higher they are, the better you are at doing the matching tasks. Commission lets you place a monk on this track, anywhere there is a free space up to your black attribute rating. Absolve removes suspicion and allows you to claim one of the benefits on the right. Fortify costs provisions and places a wall up here. Attack allows you to remove an outsider, gaining this benefit. Garrison works just like commission, but places outposts and uses the red attribute. And convert allows you to gain outsiders permanently. 
play until you run out of workers, although you may pass and keep up to three workers instead. Finally, reveal the next turn card here. Later turns can have special worker actions that anyone can use. Why would you like this game? Paladins takes a step up from most Garfield games in terms of complexity and depth. This is a genuinely heavy Euro game with a lot of moving parts. The engine building and paths to victory are many and varied. A simple example is if you manage to recruit these three characters, each time you pay off a debt, you will gain three workers. The outsiders grant in-game bonuses, but nothing that helps short term, meaning there is sizable opportunity cost to gain them. And the inner workings of the core use one attribute to boost another system means you'll be trying to chain actions across different action spaces. And the importance of those actions can change between games based on the king's orders. The best thing about this game is building an engine that works. It's so damn satisfying. However, aside from the central spots, the player interaction is limited. You will spend most of your time focused on your own board, so it's not a game for people who need high interaction. And Paladins is a step up from Architects and Raiders, and while it shares a lot in common with those games, it's definitely more of a serious gamer's game. In some ways, it's more of a heavy Euro game like an Acrony than others in the series to date. Paladins of the West Kingdom, heavy armor, heavy Euro. Kia ora koutou, and welcome to Pavlov's house in about three minutes. It's technically a game for one to three players, but it's really a solo game. Playing time's about an hour. It's a moderately complex game. It's 1942 and the Battle of Stalingrad is underway. A battle that would become one of the worst in human history. In the end, nearly two million were wounded or killed. Pavlov's house was a building that anchored the defensive line for the Russians. Can you hold the house against incredible odds? You win if the Wehrmacht deck runs out and you still control Pavlov's house. But you also need victory points from keeping the board clear and completing dangerous storm group missions. You lose if your command area is bombed or the Germans take Pavlov's house. Dice. Combat is resolved with dice rolls. Card management. Your strategic decisions are decided by cards. Tile placement. Both troops in the house and strategy tokens influence the game. Player turn. The game is played in three distinct phases, the first of which is a strategic phase. Here you will draw four cards. Fog of War cards are discarded without effect, but limit your choices. You then get to choose one of the two actions on each card. This one allows you to add troops and equipment to the house. And this one allows you to add supplies to the staging area. You'll then need this card to transfer supplies to the river and another one to deliver them. This one allows you to repair damage to the house or lay mines. Many of these actions allow you to either remove disruption from the board or place a token. You cannot place it in an area that has disruption in it. This card allows for artillery support to be used by soldiers in the house. And this one allows you to place anti-aircraft guns, which is important for the next phase where the Germans attack. You'll draw three cards and resolve them. Some will be bombers, which is where your AA guns will help. Roll two dice for each token removed. And for each success against this number, reduce the number of bombers by one. So we roll 3d6 and place a disruption marker on that spot. If the reveal cards are units, roll a d6 and place them on the matching track on the board. Infantry can be immediately attacked if you prepared suppression fire earlier. Other cards include artillery attacks against the house and snipers. The last phase is in the house, where you can freely move ready forces at the start of that phase. Only one soldier can be in a space unless they are on a weapons team. You have only three actions per turn, unless you've built the full communications network for an extra one. Actions include preparing suppressing fire, using this value here, and attacking enemies. Note that only red anti-armor attacks can hurt tanks. After each action, a unit is exhausted and it takes an action to refresh them, but leaders can take an action to refresh up to three units. Keep playing through these phases until the Wehrmacht deck runs out. Why would you like this game? This is one for the solo gamers out there. While it can be played with multiple players, it really is crafted as a solo experience first and foremost. The game looks a bit complex at first, but is actually quite rules light, which is unusual in the wargaming space, especially for solitaire games. The three scales of the game, represented in the three phases, make you feel like you're engaged in a large battle that zooms into the personal level. I've not played another game that captures strategic and tactical play at the same time quite so well, and it's full of tense moments and tough decisions, and the fear of being overwhelmed. The best thing about this game is its commitment to the history and its supporting materials. This background book is exceptional stuff. However, Stalingrad was one of the most horrific moments in human history, and that won't be something some people will want to explore in a game. Also, I'd really only recommend it if you like solo play. Like the idea of this but want zombies? Check out Dawn of the Zeds. And for a game about civilians in a siege, check out This War of Mine. Pavlov's House. 
Hello and welcome to Power Grid in about three minutes. It's a game for two to six players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is around two hours. It's a reasonably complex game. It's the 1950s and demand for electricity is rising. You're one of many power companies looking to become a dominant force in this emerging market. Can you build a power network that works, manage market scarcity, and build the power plants that people need? Or will you be the leading cause of blackouts? The game ends once one player has placed a house in 17 different cities. The winner is the player who can power the most cities at the end of that turn. Competitive. Only one company can be the best. Auctions. Power plants are auctioned each turn. Network building. To win, you must provide power to the connected cities you control. Player turn. Power grid is played in five turn phases and three steps. Step one is the start of the game. Step two occurs when someone places their seventh house. And step three is when this card is drawn from the power plant deck. You start by determining player order. This is decided by the player with the most cities going first. In case of a tie, the player with the biggest power plant goes earlier. Phase two is bidding on power plants. There are four plants available for auction and four that are currently unavailable. Plants are always ranked in numerical order, so lower number plants become available for bid first. If a player wins a bid, they cannot participate in any more auctions that round. Phase 3 is buying resources. The market in Power Grid evolves based on supply and demand. We have three power plants. The left one uses garbage, which is selling for six money each, so we buy one. The second plant can use either coal or oil. Coal is currently cheap, so we buy two to power the plant for this turn. But because it's still so cheap, we buy two more. A plant cannot store more than two turns worth of resources on it. The green plant is sustainable and doesn't need any resources. Next up is placing houses. Initially, only one house can be placed per city. It costs the number shown on the connector plus 10 to place the first house. In step two, the second house costs 15 plus the connector cost. And in step three, the third one costs 20 plus the connector the cost. Then you may power the regions you currently have houses in. Each plant has required fuel and how many houses it powers. We spend one garbage to power one city, two coal to power two more, and the sustainable one powers two by itself. We consult this chart and get 64 money for doing that. We then restock the market after checking this board. Here we will add five coal, four oil, three garbage, and two uranium to the market. Finally, replace the highest rated power plant and put it at the bottom of the deck. It is now the next turn. Why would you like this game? Power Grid is the Millennium Falcon of board games. It may not look like much, but it's got it where it counts. The game looks dry until you start playing it and then you slowly realize that the game has a lot of depth and a huge decision space. Not only that, but the level of interaction between players in terms of auctions, house placements, and resource buying are quite high for a Euro game. No power plant buying strategy works every time, as you have to take into account what other people are buying as well. Each map has more options than you first think, as even in a six player game, game only uses five of the possible regions of that map and the core box comes with a double-sided map with the US on the reverse and there are also many 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 expansion maps the best thing about this game is dealing with scarcity in a five-player game you can only ever have three power plants so you have to keep replacing them as you go through the game however it's a skill heavy game where early mistakes can be punished spend too much early on or pick a bad start position and you can be left behind very quickly and for a game about power generation it doesn't comment on the side effects of that industry. If you want a game that deals with pollution as a consequence, check out CO2 or Energy Empire. Power Grid shares a lot in common with a popular Concordia, and I think if you like one, you should probably try the other as well. Power Grid, 15 years old, still powerful. Kia ora koutou, and welcome to Raiders of the North Sea in about three minutes. Review copy used, part of our program to promote New Zealand gaming. It is a game for two to four players. There is a solo mode, but it's available separately. Playing time's around 60 to 90 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. You come from the land of the ice and snow, from the midnight sun where the hot springs blow. You will drive your ships to new lands. You will send your warband to Valhalla. You will conquer lands of green, make ruins, and become the overlord of the western shore. Well, you hope you can, as there is always another warband trying to outdo your efforts to become the greatest raider of the North Sea. You win if you have the most points at the end of the game. The game ends when all but one of the fortress spaces has been raided. You gain points from raiding, sending warriors to Valhalla, upgrading your armor, making offerings, 
to the chieftain of your tribe and from character cards. Competitive. Only one player can be the greatest raider. Worker placement. You place and remove workers from action spaces to gain the associated benefits. Card management. Your crew cards can be used in multiple ways. Player turn. On your turn you place workers or raid. If you place workers, put one on the board and claim that space's benefit. In this case, three silver. You then take a worker from any other action space and claim that benefit as well, giving you a total of two actions. The gatehouse gives you extra crew cards and the town hall lets you play a crew member for their special ability. The barracks lets you recruit a crew member to your warband, while the treasury allows you to discard cards for gold or silver. The mill gives you the supplies you need to raid, while the armory allows you to spend resources to increase your armor score. The longhouse lets you trade livestock for supplies or to spend goods to claim an offering token. The cost and supplies to raid a region is printed on the board, as is the minimum crew needed. Place your worker in an empty spot, then take the worker and goods from an area. It can no longer be raided. Gain this number in yellow as victory points. Some later raids require grey or white workers granted from earlier raids. They also have a value printed in red. This is a number you have to make to score the victory points marked here. There's a combination of your armor score from this track, the total value of your crew's combat abilities in red, and the values rolled on the dice on the board. If you gain a black Valkyrie marker from a raid, you must lose one of your crew members. This does increase your Valkyrie score track though. Keep playing until the second to last fortress has been raided. Why would you like this game? Raiders of the North Sea has a unique ebb and flow to it, and figuring out how to chain together raids and keep doing actions that gain you points is really rewarding. The game hits that sweet spot of being easy to learn, but having enough depth that skilled players can really go to town. I'm also a fan of games that have multi-use cards, as they give you more options and more decisions to make. And the cards themselves are gorgeous, and the Mycos art really elevates the game's overall look and feel. The best thing about this game is the place a worker, take a worker mechanic. It's a different take on worker placement, and it works really well. However, setting up the game takes a little on the long side, as you have to place all of the tokens on the board. And Viking, looting, kidnapping, and pillaging is certainly not everyone's idea of a good time. While heavily abstracted, this is very much a Viking game. The designer of Raiders also co-designed Architects of the West Kingdom, which has yet another interesting take on worker placement. And if you want more Viking and more pillaging, look at Blood Rage. Raiders of the North Sea. Did you know Vikings are noun and a verb? It Kia ora koutou and welcome to Rurik, Dawn of Kiev, in about three minutes. Review copy used. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode using Automa cards. Playing time's around 90 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. It's the 11th century and Vladimir the Great is dead. You are his heirs and successors. And as the empire descends into chaos, you are making your claim on the crown. Will you become the grand prince or princess of Kiev? You win if at the end of four rounds you have the most points. You gain points by advancing on these tracks, fighting other players, and completing public and private goals. Competitive. Only one player can be the successor to Vladimir the Great. Area control. Having units and buildings and regions will help you win the game. Auctions and worker placement. Rurik's core action mechanic involves placing workers on these tracks and paying to increase their value. Player turn. The core of Rurik is its action selection system. Each player starts with four different workers and will gain up to two more during play. Each has a number on them. This number represents both their bidding value and the order they resolve in. There are six actions, which I will detail later, but the higher you are on an action track, the more efficient that action is. Players will alternate placing workers one at a time. If the worker you place has a high value, it will push the lower value worker down the track. If the values are tied or lower, it is placed on the first empty space. You can spend coins to increase a worker's value by one per coin spent. Keep placing and moving workers until all players run out. Then resolve each action, starting with the first player's number one worker and going through to the last player's number five worker. Some of these actions will require you to spend coins. Muster allows you to place one soldier per muster symbol in an area where you have a soldier or building already. Move allows you to move as many spaces as the symbol shown. This movement can be split as you see fit and one unit may make multiple moves. Combat allows you to make as many attacks as the symbol shown. You can attack rebels, removing one for each attack. If you do, flip them over and claim the reward under their base. Or you can attack an opponent, removing one of their soldiers. You will also have to draw a number of scheme cards and if you draw one with this symbol, you will also lose a soldier. Tax allows you to gain a resource from a region. If you rule that region by having more forces than your opponents, it costs you one tax symbol. If you have a market, you will get extra rewards, and you can tax an area you don't control for two tax symbols. Tax goods go onto your trade boat, and any filled columns will grant you income at the end of the turn. Build allows you to place buildings. Strongholds help you rule and defend regions, while churches convert opponent soldiers. Only one of each type of building can be in a region, but multiple players can have buildings in the same region. The final action allows you to draw and keep scheme cards, which can be played as additional actions 
based on their symbols in later turns. Why would you like this game? I focused a lot on the action programming mechanic and that's because I think this is an exceptional game system. It's simple to comprehend yet will cause steam to come out of your ears as you plan the best possible moves with it. Outside of that engaging system, the core game is good, with a nice mix of area control, building, resource gathering and conflict. But not so much conflict that you feel as though you're at each other's throats the whole game. Rurik is not about assembling massive armies and fighting set battles. It's a game of planning, positioning and knowing the best time to act. The heroes and their figures are also very nicely done. The best thing about this game is the action programming, but as I've already mentioned that, I'll give a shout out to Rurik's excellent production values and wonderful storage system. However, that action programming system will overload some people, and it might be the most analysis paralysis prone game ever designed. The victory point system is also a pro and a con, as once you advance on the track, you cannot go backwards. While this stops kingmaking, it can also make it difficult to pull in a leader. I find the feel of this game, with its limited combat, action planning, building and resource gathering, similar in many ways to Scythe. And if you like the idea of programming actions, but want something a lot sillier, try Robo Rally. Rurik. Now I really need to take a muster action, so I should probably do that with my- If you enjoyed- Kia ora, and welcome to Sidereal Confluence in about three minutes. This is a game for four to nine players. There's no solo mode. Playing time is two hours or more. It's a pretty complex game. In the dark reaches of space, nine different alien races form a trade federation. Setting aside distrust and war, they work together to create peace through prosperity. Can you wheel or deal your way to financial security? Or will you be left holding 10 crates of self-sealing stem bolts? You win if at the end of six turns, you have the most victory points. Competitive. Only one player can have the strongest economy. Engine building. Your economy will expand and get more efficient as the game goes on. Trading. This game is all about trading. Player turn. The core of this game is a real-time trading phase that is so frantic and chaotic I could never do it justice. This game has a lot of resources. Three different types of small cube, three large cubes, ultra tech cylinders, victory points, and ships are the main ones. In general, three small cubes are worth two large cubes, or an ultra tech, a victory point, or three ships. But what do you do with all these resources? Each player will have cards called converters. Converters take a set number of resources and turn them into new ones. For example, oceanic processing turns two green into one brown and a large blue. The value shown here is how efficient the converter is. This turns two value of cubes into two and a half, which is not very efficient. There are some converters that need no inputs, like this one here. This is a research team. Cards with purple arrows can be used during the trading phase. And this one allows you to spend the resources shown to get the victory points listed, including this turn's sharing bonus. Each new technology also gives you a new converter. However, if you look at the bottom of some converters, you will see technologies mentioned. Quantum computing could be kept by itself as a converter, or used to flip the other card so it works more efficiently. Many planets also give free resources, and may be upgraded during the trading phase. In the trading phase, you can trade anything. Cubes, planets, converters, all of it. And all deals are binding. Once trading is done, you have the industry phase, where you can use powers with white arrows. Run whatever converters you want to and then collect the resources produced. Then any technologies researched that turn are shared to all other players who either gain them as converters or use them to upgrade existing converters. Finally, you use ships to bid on planets with the highest bidder getting first pick of new planets. Then repeat that process for getting new research teams to discover new technology. Why would you like this game? Sidereal Confluence is an experience, no other way to describe it. It has an incredibly hectic trading phase that transitions into a very detail-focused economy phase where you are trying to maximize efficiency. What defines the game most, though, is the complete asymmetry between different alien races, all of whom have different strengths and weaknesses. The Zeth have an economy based on stealing and extorting off other races. Unity produce special grey cubes that can be used in any converters, and the Enient have the most powerful converters in the game, but they're not allowed to run them themselves so they have to trade them away. Learning the quirks of each race and how the unique playstyle works is a really wonderful experience. The best thing about this game is how you shift from making trades and haggling to building this giant expanding economy. No game mixes extroverted and introverted playstyles so vividly for me. However, this game can just be overwhelming. And while the race reference sheets give great advice, your first play will likely be a confusing mess of missteps and chaos. And like all games involving high social interaction and noisy trading, it can be very challenging if you're not so confident. If you like the concept of alien races, but would rather invade someone with spaceships, check out Twilight Imperium. And for a more straightforward trading game, check out the classic Chinatown. Sidereal Confluence. It's Chinatown. On steroids. In space! Kia ora koutou, and welcome to Space Corp 
in about three minutes. Review copy used. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode complete with its own rulebook. Playing times around one hour per era. It's a pretty complex game. Humanity is taking its first steps into a wider world. A rocket to the moon, orbital stations, then onto Mars. Next comes the belt, the Jovian moons, and the great gas giants. Finally, we leave the confines of our solar system and begin the long journey into the void to new stars. Can you build a corporation that can control the vast reaches of space? You win if at the end of the game you have the most profit. Space Corp is unusual in that you can choose to play one, two, or three eras of play and end the game at the end of any era. Each era ends once two players pass or six of the seven objectives have been completed. Competitive. Only one corporation can be the most successful. Card management. Actions in this game use cards. Engine building. Infrastructure and science cards give your corporations ongoing advantages. Player turn. On your turn you will take one main action and some secondary actions. Most actions have a numerical strength associated with them, as shown on the cards. Your infrastructure cards, when placed on your board, add to the strength of any cards played. For example, we have two research infra and play a two research card. This gives us a research total of four. Research is how you gain new cards, and you can take them from the face-up offers or from the top of the deck. Any card that says, may upgrade as infra, may be added to one of your infra slots, and you may replace cards in those slots as well. The move action allows you to move one of your teams from base to a site within range. We have four move here, and it costs two to leave Earth's gravity, one to go to the moon, and one to land. The explore action needs an explore value equal to or higher than the area's E rating, in this case one. You then get an exploration token, flip it, and gain any rewards. You can build using the build action. This needs to be a higher value than the B rating on the location you're building on, and the base needs to work with the exploration token. A refinery on exotic elements is a match, a spaceport would not be. You can also produce at a base with a P score, gaining profit equal to that score, plus one for this refinery. After your main action, you can claim an objective, move teams between bases, and if you have less than four cards, you draw one. The second era introduces radiation, which makes space travel more costly, as well as technologies you can discover with the revelations and genetics actions. The final era introduces interstellar travel, which takes multiple turns and colony building. Infrastructure gets better through each age to help you, but the distances between things get much, much bigger. Why would you like this game? Space Corp strikes a wonderful balance between having the depth to make space exploration feel epic while not being overwhelmingly complex. This there's some randomness in the token draw when exploring, which makes you adapt your strategies, although you may prefer to play without the tokens that only punish players when they explore. The three-act structure of the game not only allows you to enjoy the game in smaller servings if you want to, it also acts as a guided tutorial, as each era adds new mechanics and concepts. The acts also contribute to a genuine sense of progression throughout the game, as you go from humble lunar landing to your first interstellar colony. The best thing about this game is how damned legible the cards are. I can't get over how easy they are to read from across the table. However, the time cards, which can give you double actions, are a little swingy, and luckily drawing them can be a huge advantage. And while it's not the most complex game, you'll definitely need to play it twice in order to get how the different systems work together. For a more detailed game about space exploration, try Leaving Earth. And if you like this idea, but want something far, far simpler, try Farlight. Space Corp, it's full of stars. Kyorokoto, and welcome to Splendor in about three minutes. It's a game for two to four players. There's no solo mode, but there is an app. Playing time's around 30 minutes. It's a pretty damn simple game. It's the Renaissance, and you are an apprentice jeweler looking to make a name for themselves by cutting and crafting gems collected from all over the world in order to obtain the favor of the noble elites. Will you craft the crown jewels for Elizabeth I and Catherine de' Medici? Or will desperation force you to make a house call to Countess Elizabeth Bathory? You win if you have the most points at the end of the game. Points are shown at the top left of nobles and cards. Once one player has scored 15 points, you finish that round and then total your scores. Competitive, only one player can have the best jeweler's store. Set collection, you will need sets of cards and gems to win the game. Engine building, the more cards you have collected, the easier expensive ones are to get. Player turn. Set up the board with the gem reserve within reach of everyone and three rows of four cards each. Each turn in Splendor consists of taking one of four actions and then the next player acts. The first action is to take one of any three different gems from the reserve. You can mix and match these as you wish as long as they are all different. The second action is to take two gems of the same type. If there are no gems of the type you want in the reserve, you cannot take any of them. Players can have no more than 10 gems at any time. You can reserve a card from the display, take that card into your hand and collect one gold. You can only have three reserve cards at any time. 
Gold is a wildcard resource that can be used in the place of any other gem. Now what do you do with these gems you ask? Well the final action is to buy a card, either from your hand of reserves or from the display. A card's cost is shown in its bottom left. For example, this one costs 4 rubies. Put any gems spent back in the reserve and claim the card. Some cards, like this one, cost a variety of different gems. Each card also has a gem in its top right. This gem counts towards the cost of buying future cards. So this card normally costs 2 white, 3 blue and 3 red. We pay the 2 white gems as normal, but we only have to play 1 blue gem to make up the difference. And because we have 3 red gem cards already, we have to pay nothing there. The last thing to mention is nobles. At the start of the game they will be in play, and you will immediately claim them once you have the number of gem cards shown on them. This does not cost you an action. Keep playing until the game ends and total up your score. Why would you like this game? Splendor is an exceptionally good game for people new to the hobby or for those veterans who want a change of pace and a short intense game. The speed of which the game can be played is really good and when you have a group humming with it the game flies by. It's incredibly accessible with rules you can teach to children and people with limited hobby game experience. But there's still enough happening in the game that a skilled player will almost always win. And the art does something I wish more games would do, make the functions of a card really clear. You can see which are the ruby cards from a mile off. The best thing about this game is the satisfying clunkiness of the tokens. However, there is a slight procedural sameness to a game of Splendor, and the game can get repetitive after a while. And while it can be entertaining to play, it really creates great moments or stories to share about it. Oh, and the box is way oversized for what's in it. If you're looking for a similar experience, but with a tiny bit more complexity, try Century Golem Edition or Century Spice Road. And if shiny things appeal to you, try Azul, Stained Glass of Sintra. Splendor, Diamond, Ruby, Sapphire, Emerald, and Chocolate. Kia ora koutou, and welcome to Star Realms in about three minutes. Note this also covers Colony War and Frontiers. It is a game for one to six players. It has a solo mode. Playing time's around 10 minutes per player. It's a relatively simple game. The galaxy is there for the taking. You are a would-be emperor trying to marshal the forces of the Trade Federation, Star Empire, Machine Cult, and the dreaded Blobs into an awesome fighting machine. Will you have the authority to claim the galaxy? Or will swarms of enemy ships smash you to pieces? In a normal game, you win if you are the last player remaining. This game can be played competitively, cooperatively, or in teams. Player elimination. When you run out of authority, you are eliminated. Deck building. You start with a basic deck and improve it during play. Player turn. At the start of the game, you will have a basic deck of 10 cards. Two of these are Vipers with one damage, and the other eight are Scouts with one gold. You also normally start with 50 Authority. You can track this using one of these systems. Reduce your authority for each damage played by your opponent. You will have a hand of five cards, and on your turn you can play them in any order. Each gold and damage enters a pool, and you can split their use as you see fit. To improve your deck, you will need to spend gold and there are always 5 face-up available cards for purchase. These cost the amount shown in their top right corner in gold. We buy the Imperial Fighter and immediately replace it in the purchase row. This reveals an Imperial Frigate, and as we still have 3 gold to spend, we buy that as well. All ship cards played and purchased this round go into your discard pile, and you redraw to 5 cards. Once your draw pile is empty, you reshuffle it to make a new deck to draw from. In addition to the 5 face-up cards for purchase, there are always explorers you can buy as well. Most cards are ships, but the horizontal ones are stations. They stay in play until they are destroyed. Ones with black shields in their bottom right also screen you from damage, and your opponent has to destroy them first. Ones with white shields do not block damage, but still can be destroyed. Once you have more advanced cards, combos and advanced actions can take place. We play these three cards first. Each card plays its top power, for example, gain 4 authority and 2 gold. But note the faction symbol on the top left. Because we have multiple cards from the same faction, they can activate these powers as well, but only on cards matching that faction. Finally, some cards have this symbol, which means you can remove the card from your deck to use that power. Why would you like this game? Star Realms, in all its versions, is an excellent deck building game that crams a lot of decisions and fun into a very short time frame. It's also pretty easy to teach and has simple core rules. The four factions are quite distinct, with red being all about tough bases and trimming weak cards from your deck, yellow about drawing cards and making your opponent discard, blue focuses on money and regaining authority, and green is all about the damage. And that leads to the core fun of this game, deciding how to build your deck and what combos to include as the game evolves. And the game constantly accelerates. You go from doing one damage in the first
first few turns to 20 or more later in the game. The best thing about this game is it captures the feeling of playing casual Magic the Gathering without the pressure to spend more money. However, you are at the mercy of what cards are face up on the table when your turn comes around. If you really want more blue and yellow cards and the table is all green, too bad. And the authority cards in the original Star Realms are just a pain to use. There's a bunch of different expansions and versions, which could be confusing. And I recommend getting Frontiers first if you want to play with groups. And if you don't like the theme, Hero Realms and Cthulhu Realms use the same core system. And for a more complex deck builder, try Aeon's End. Star Realms. Just don't burn out on the app. If you are a Koto and welcome to Twilight Struggle in about three minutes. It is a game for two players. There is no solo mode. Playing time's around three hours. It's a pretty complex game. It's 1945 and World War II is over. In the aftermath of that horrific conflict, two global superpowers emerge. The United States and the Soviet Union, representing the ideologies of capitalism and communism. Through buying influence, coups and proxy wars, these superpowers battled across the world for 50 years. Can you lead your superpower to ideological triumph? Or will you make the world burn in nuclear fire? You win if at any point you have 20 more victory points than your opponent. You also lose if the death contract reaches one during your turn. If you make it to the end of the game, the winner is the player with the victory point advantage. Competitive, only one player can win this titanic clash. Card management, all actions in this game are determined by cards. Area control, growing your influence in different regions is the key to winning. Player turn, on your turn you will be dealt a hand of cards. There are four types of cards. The first two have US and Soviet aligned events on them. When you play a card matching your faction, you can choose to either play the event in the text below or spend the points in the star on operations. If the card is one of your opponents, you can play it for the operations points and the event automatically happens. You can choose if the event triggers before or after your operations. The other two card types are neutral cards, which either player can use for the event or operation, and scoring cards. The first card played each turn is called the headline card. You must play this card for its event and they are played face down and resolved in order from largest to smallest. Play then starts with the Soviets and alternates between the players for six or seven rounds. Operations points can be spent to take one of three actions. The first is to build influence. For each point on the card, increase your influence on the board by one. So France from one to three. Alternatively, you can spread that influence around. Note that any influence placed must be adjacent to some of your existing influence. At the top right of each region is its stability score. If you ever have this much more influence in a region than your opponent, you are considered to control the region. Placing influence in a controlled region costs two points. The second operation is a coup. Place your operations card and then roll a die. Add those together and subtract double the region's stability score. Subtract that amount of opponent's influence and add your own influence if that would take the score past zero. Also, if this country is a battleground, as marked by the solid blue bar at the top, increase the death contract by one. Coups also give you military operations points. You will lose a victory point at the end of the turn for each point the death contract is above your military ops track. The last operation is realignment where you try to weaken your opponent's influence. This is an opposed role modified by who has the most influence in that region and its neighbors. Once per turn, if you don't want to play a card, you can spend it on the space race. Scoring cards are based on who controls what in the region. In this case, both players have presence, but if the US controlled France as well, they would score domination points. At the start of the game, you only have the early war cards. Add the mid-war ones at turn four and the late war at turn eight. Why would you like this game? Twilight Struggle is one of my all-time favorite games and I wish I could play it more often. It's a game that requires you to think turns in advance while managing short-term risks based on your hand draw. The conflict rages across six distinct regions whose importance ebbs and flows based on the scoring cards. Losing track of what's happening in one region can cost you the game, and it's basically a giant history lesson on the Cold War. The cards are all about pivotal events and people, and that's backed up with more information in the rulebook. The best thing about this game is the card mechanics. Having a hand of your opponent's events makes for some really painful decisions. However, this is a long complex game and not one that will appeal to people who want a light, breezy play experience. For a similar game about World War I, check out Paths of Glory. And if the war theme isn't for you, try 1960, The Making of a President. Twilight Struggle. We play it not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Kia ora koutou, and welcome to Star Wars Outer Rim in about three minutes. Review copy used. It is a game for one to four players. There is a solo AI opponent. Playing time's around two hours. It's a moderately complex game. 
It's not my fault. I didn't mean to get stopped by that Imperial Patrol, and I certainly didn't want to dump that cargo into space. Look, if the Syndicate wants their money back, I can get it for them. I just need a bit more time. You've heard all these excuses before and you don't care. A job is a job, and the Warren said dead or alive. Who's next on the bounty board? You win by being the first player to accumulate 10 fame points. Fame is gained by completing goals and missions. Competitive. Only one player can be the most space famous. Narrative. This game comes with a lot of encounter cards. Dice. But most of the important actions require dice rolls. Player turn. One of the first things to note about this game is that you have a lot of information on your character display. There's your fame score, personal combat ability, health, jobs, money, gear, and reputation. Reputation can be positive, neutral, or negative for each of the four factions in the game. You also have a ship display, which has your speed, ship combat ability, ship health, cargo, mods, and crew. Each turn has three main phases. The first, you can either recover all damage you have taken, gain 2,000 credits, or move your ship. Then you have the action phase, where you can use actions from your character or cards. And if you're on a planet, you can buy something from the face-up card displays. When you buy a card from the display, the matching patrol ship moves the number of spaces shown towards you. Patrols stop your movement if you do not have a positive reputation with them. You can also attack them for rewards at the cost of reputation with that faction. You can also deliver cargo if you are in the right location. Finally, there is the encounter phase. You can draw an encounter card for the planet you are on, or a waypoint encounter if you are in deep space. Alternatively, you can choose to turn over one of the face down encounter tokens on the board or encounter a face up one. You then check the card index for the number matching that shown on the contact and follow its instructions. If you have a bounty on that character, you can choose to fight them instead. You take one damage for each hit they roll and capture them if you score more hits than they do. If you recruit or capture someone, remove their token from the board. Finally, there are job cards, which require you to go to a location and pass a series of skill checks. If you have the skill in question, you need to roll one success on two dice. If you don't, you need to roll the critical hit symbol on two dice. And if you have the skill twice, any symbol counts as a success. Why would you like this game? Obviously the Star Wars theme is a big deal for a lot of people, and this game executes that theme really well. You'll feel like a smuggler or a bounty hunter operating on the rim, and the jobs, cards, and equipment all reinforce that. There's also a real sense of progression, as you start with a rust bucket ship, but you can buy newer ones, and get better gear, and then even upgrade your ships. Each of the eight characters also feels different, and starts with different goals and playstyles. Lando's far better suited to swindling and smuggling, while Boss gets sells at fighting. And there's a bucket load of cards in the game. Something I've been critical of FFG in the past is putting out games that feel like a starter box. The Outer Rim actually feels like a full game. The best thing about this game is that it is a sandbox experience. If you want to turn Boba Fett into a back to tank salesman, you can. However, this game is more of a romp than a tense mental exercise. It's far more about the journey than the final goal. Random events and other players collecting bounties on your crew can destroy a lot of plans. And some of the components are not quite up to scratch in my mind. The player boards in my copy came warped, there are only six dice to share, and the money tokens are very basic. I'll be using dice from X-Wing and money from Xia to supplement the game. And speaking of Xia, if you want an even bigger and more involved space sandbox game, check that one out. And if you think Malcolm Reynolds is cooler than Han Solo, try Firefly. Star Wars Outer Rim. You can shoot first. Kia ora koto and welcome to Star Wars Rebellion in about three minutes. It is a game for two to four players. There's no official solo mode. Playing time is around two to four hours. It's a pretty complex game. It is a period of civil war. Rebel spaceships striking from a hidden base have won their first victory against the evil Galactic Empire. You will command either the Rebel Alliance or the Galactic Empire in this epic struggle to decide the fate of the galaxy. Will the Empire snuff out the last sparks of freedom or will the Rebellion emerge victorious? The Rebel player will select a location for their hidden base, and the Empire win the game if they occupy that planet. The Rebels win if the victory marker ever reaches the turn marker, and they can move the victory marker by completing objectives. Competitive or teams, only one faction can win this game. Secret orders, the actions you plan to take will be kept secret from your opponent. Dice, combat is decided by dice rolls. Player turn, rebellion focuses around leaders, and every action you take will use one. You start each turn by assigning leaders to different tasks. Assignments resolve immediately, and other actions include repeatable missions, which can be used each turn, and one-off missions that are discarded once used. To conduct a mission, you must meet the skill requirements of the card, but you can assign up to two leaders. Any leaders not assigned to a mission can move fleets or defend against enemy actions. Once all leaders are assigned, each player resolves one leader action at a time. To move fleets, take a leader from your leader pool and place them on the board. Then move any adjacent fleets to that region noting that many units need a transport to move. If the Empire takes an empty planet, 
place an occupied marker on it. Later, the Emperor wants to use a mission, and reveals rule by fear and increases that planet's loyalty. Princess Leia and Chewie attempt a mission. Vader, who is in reserve, can attempt to block this action, forcing a roll off based on character skill levels. Combat happens whenever a player moves into an area with their opponent's units, and happens both in space and on land. The defender can also assign a leader. Each leader draws combat cards based on their leadership ratings. Then roll dice based on each unit's combat skills and assign damage. Units who take too much damage are removed. Fight space battles, then land battles. At the end of the round, reclaim all leaders and repeatable missions. Then draw two new missions. The Imperial player draws two probe cards, which limit the locations the Rebel base can be moved to. Then the Rebel draws the top objective card. Advance the turn marker. In the first five turns, you will then draw two action cards and select one to keep along with the associated leader. On every second turn, you can build units based on the planets you control and their build icons. Place them on the build queue, then move all units on that queue down, placing those pushed off the queue on the board. Why would you like this game? Rebellion allows you to retell the story of Star Wars in your own way, while providing a wealth of excellent decisions to make. But what makes this game are the narratives that come out. Princess Leia can steal the Death Star plans from Coruscant, but Mon Mothma can be captured and turned to the dark side, becoming an ambassador for evil. Luke can seek Yoda at Dagobah and become a Jedi Master, or Tarkin could build the second Death Star there. It's the closest anyone has come to really making you feel like you're in command of a side during the Galactic Civil War. The best thing about this game is doing this. Take that, Jar Jar. However, as much as I love Rebellion, it's a long game with a lot of rules. That won't be for everyone. And it really is just a two-player game. The three to four player modes are less than ideal. And the combat system is pretty ordinary, which is why they changed it in the expansion. Like the game but prefer fantasy settings? Check out War of the Ring. And after a Star Wars game that's a little less complex, try the Outer Rim. Rebellion. Fully armed and operational. Kia ora koutou, and welcome to Tainted Grail in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing times as long as it takes. It's a pretty complex game. A blight has come to Avalon. A disease spreads across the land, and the men hairs that warred against the corruption are failing. Can your team of misfits and malcontents unravel the mystery behind the corruption in the land? Or does a miserable death await you in the fog? The game is played in 15 chapters. You win each chapter by completing its goals. Narrative. This game is loaded with story elements. Character advancement. Your characters will develop and grow through the campaign. Player turn. Select the character you want to play and grab their player board. There are six attributes. Your player board will tell you what your starting values are. These are used in combat and diplomacy, as well as adventuring. You also have energy, health, and terror scores. Energy is how many actions you can take, and terror is how badly the horrors of the island have messed you up. At the bottom of the player board are your resources, how much food, wealth, and magic you have stored, as well as your reputation and your experience points. You'll also have a starting brief that tells you about your character's motivation. You will adventure to different locations. This is the start point, location 101. This location has a task you can do to spend one energy to gain one reputation. It also has symbols at the top showing you you can dream here to gain story insights, that it is a settlement, and that it contains a men here. Men here are these big things. They prevent the horrors of the island overwhelming civilization. They need to be maintained in order for you to keep playing. Locations will have these arrows, which show the other locations nearby. Actions you can take include moving to a location. You can only move to the nine locations around an active men here. Exploring an area where you flip over the card and follow the instructions. This will likely take you to the storybook. Combat involves playing cards that match the attributes of previously played cards. Bjorn has sufficient skills to get bonuses from all of these. We play a card and check how it matches up. Both of these matchups show one cube, which is one damage to the monster. We can only play one card before the monster's counterattack, unless you play a fast card like this. This here means we draw one card, and if we spent one magic resource, we could also activate this power here for one more damage. We check the enemy card to see what it does. It has taken two damage, so attacks us. We prevent that damage because of the card we played. Diplomacy works in a similar way, but using diplomacy cards instead of combat, and you're trying to shift their opinion instead of doing damage. Keep taking actions until you decide to pass or run out of energy. Then eat food to regain health and lose terror, then refill your action meter and draw the next event card. Why would you like this game? This game is an epic sprawling adventure where you have a huge amount of freedom to search around and discover things, while still feeling the time pressure 
of the scenario goal. There's a huge world to explore with around 100 different locations, but I think the best way to show you at scale is to zoom out from the starter map to show you the rest of the world. The combat and diplomacy system is tricky to learn, but has a lot of depth, and there's definitely some deep thinking required to excel at it. And there are so many cool little secrets to discover all over the place. The best thing about this game is how different characters can reveal different parts of the story. However, a 15 chapter epic is not something you can casually commit to. I'd really not recommend playing it unless you have the time to play it through. And the men here, while a cool idea, are a pain. They obscure the locations, you have to move them to read the cards, and reading what's on the dial isn't easy. The Seventh Continent uses a similar system for exploration and storytelling. And weirdly, Tainted Grail reminds me a lot of the fighting fantasy book series. Tainted Grail. Grimdark meets King Arthur. Kia ora koutou, and welcome to Tapestry in about three minutes. It is a game for one to five players. It has a solo mode using Automa cards. Playing times around 30 minutes per player. It's a moderately complex game. In Tapestry, you will guide a civilization down different development paths, explore the world, conquer it, and maybe even go into space. But what guides your civilization most of all are the Tapestry cards that shape your destiny. You win Tapestry if you have the most points at the end of five eras. Players will also end the game at different times. Competitive, everyone is leading their own civilization and only one can win. Variable player powers, each civilization has very different abilities. Player turn, each player selects one of two civilizations they are dealt. Then grab a player board and cover all but the leftmost spots on those boards with buildings. You'll also receive a city map. There are two types of turns in Tapestry, an income turn and an advancement turn. On an income turn, you will collect resources based on what is showing on your building tracks. In this case, one of each resource, a tapestry card, and an exploration tile. The more of these spaces that are exposed, the more things you will get. On eras two to four, you will also play a tapestry card and collect the bonus from that. Most turns are advancement turns, and they require you to spend the resources shown above to move right on a track. The first era always costs one of any resource. There are four tracks, science, technology, exploration, and military, each of which has an associated basic building. There are many, many different abilities on this track, so I'll sum up the basic ones only. Exploration allows you to draw tiles and then place them on the board. And the more terrain types that line up on the tiles, the more points you'll get. Military allows you to place conquest markers. When you conquer a territory, you roll these dice and choose either victory points or the resources shown. If you conquer someone else's territory, knock over their marker. Unless they have a trap card, in which case they knock over yours. Technology allows you to get tech cards, which you can advance once per era, gaining the benefits shown at each step. And science allows you to roll the science die, advancing on the track rolled. Buildings can be obtained from technology cards and advancing on tracks, and they go into your city. If you fill a block of nine tiles with buildings, you gain a resource, and you also score points for completing columns and rows. Play continues until all players have finished five errors. Why would you like this game? Tapestry is a game for two main types of people. The first are those who will play it casually and will enjoy the gameplay loop of advancing and getting bonuses. For this group, the game will be a light, fun experience where every decision gives them a small reward throughout the game. The second are those people who will play it over and over again, attempting to drag out as many points as they can by optimizing every step of the game. And there's definitely a puzzle here to engage people. Maximizing your actions and points earning will keep this group entertained for many, many plays. The best thing about this game is how it looks. Rom, the guy who designed the model buildings, is from my hometown, and he was the guy who inspired me to take up miniature painting in high school. However, the buildings are used just as markers on the map and have no other game purpose. This was underwhelming. The variance between tapestry cards is significant and having the right card can make a huge difference to your score. And in general, doing well early translates into bigger end game scores with few levers your opponents can pull to slow you down. And the civilization theme is jarring at times. You can go to space without having discovered stone tools. The scoring system and track advancement in Tapestry is similar to much shorter roll and write games like Gant Schön Clever. And for a more traditional civilization game, try Nations. Tapestry, that's pretty civilization. Kia ora koutou and welcome to the Artemis Project in about three minutes. This is the Kickstarter version. It's a game for one to five players. It has a solo mode. Playing times around 60 to 90 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. Jupiter's moon Europa, long known to have an icy surface, has been revealed to have deep oceans absolutely teeming with life 
and scientific opportunity. Will you build a thriving colony under the ice or will you freeze to death in the frozen wasteland above? You win if at the end of six turns you have the most points and points come from a bunch of places. Competitive. Everyone is trying to run the most impressive research station. Dice. Actions in this game involve placing dice on the board. Player turn. At the start of the game, collect the player board. This is where you store your five action dice, energy, which you use to look after colonists, minerals, which you use to construct buildings, toolkits, which can modify dice results by one pip each, badges, which you gain from conducting expeditions, and your four different types of colonists. Colonists can also be placed in buildings once you have some. Each turn starts with an event card, which will activate at some point that turn. Place this marker to remind yourself when that will be. Then draw expeditions equal to the number of players minus one. Each expedition card shows a number of energy and minerals. Add that amount to their matching places on the board equal to the total on the cards plus two. Players then alternate placing dice on the board until they run out. Then you resolve each spot in turn. Expeditions need a total dice value assigned to them, equal to this value to succeed. Colonists sent with a die can modify this result. The winner gets the first choice of reward, and the runner-up gets a second choice. Both players also claim expedition badges. Minerals and energy work the same way. You claim a number of resources matching the dice you have placed. But if later in the turn other players place smaller value dice, the higher ones are bumped right, which means the smaller ones may claim all of the resources. If this happens, move your relief marker one step for each die removed and claim a bonus from this track. Buildings go to the highest bidder and cost a number of minerals equal to what was bid. When you construct a building, you can move colonists onto it immediately. This will ensure it works later in the turn. The doorstep allows you to recruit colonists, spending two energy per recruit. And the academy allows you to retrain colonists into different roles. You can also spend your dice to get toolkits. Once all spaces on the board are resolved, buildings activate and you must pay power to keep any colonists in your shelter alive. When turn four starts, surface buildings will be available to build and these focus on end game points. Keep playing until six rounds are over. Why would you like this game? The Artemis Project is a very tidy, tightly designed, attractive and accessible game. The core gameplay of dice placement is very simple and yet produces some tense decisions and moments in the game. And the game excels in presenting an array of important decisions each turn. You need resources, people, expeditions and buildings and you never feel like you have enough moves. But somehow you can still build an effective engine if you place your dice right. The art is wonderfully bright and evocative and does a great job of building the world of Europa. And it's also not a table hog. The board is only as big as it needs to be and the player boards are just the right size. The best thing about this game is the exposure mechanic, which means people might bump you off resource tracks. It makes for some very tactical decisions on when and where to place. However, this game does have some take that in it. And if you don't like the idea of people disrupting your plans and bumping you off things, this one won't be for you. Overall though, I can't find much to hate in the game, but I can see some people finding it a relatively safe design. If you like sci-fi and dice placement, check out Circadian's First Light. Alternatively, you could try Euphoria, build a better dystopia. The Artemis Project, as cool as ice. Kia ora koto and welcome to The Expanse in about three minutes. It is a game for two to four players. There is no solo mode. Playing time's around 90 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. War is coming to the solar system. Martian military dominance has been threatened by an attack by unknown forces. But Earth seems to be responsible. Or is there another actor at play here? An external or even alien influence? Either way, the people of Earth's outer colonies, the Belters, will be the ones at the front line of any coming conflict. You will win if after the last scorecard is played, you have the most victory points. Victory points are gained for controlling territories and lost by purchasing and keeping cards. Competitive, only one faction can win. Card management, cards determine what actions you can take and what events happen. Area control, points are scored for controlling different areas on the board. Player turn, each turn one player will select the card to play. Cards cost a number of victory points to procure as shown here. Only the leftmost card is free. The first player to act is the OPA. You can select the card and play it for its event, which is the text below, or play it for its ops points, which is the number in the top right of the card. Ops points can be spent on any of the following actions. In this example, the Mars player has three op points. They use one to move a fleet, one band, a second to place an influence in a region they have a fleet, and the final one to build a new ship in their home territory. You can split your ops points as you wish. For example, Earth uses all four to place influence in one region. You can also select the card to keep by paying one victory point. This is your action for the turn, but the card may be played in a later turn. Whenever a player selects a card for ops points, 
the other players may be able to trigger the event. This happens in order of placement on the initiative track here. Your faction symbol needs to be on the card in order to use the event, so while the OPA is the first on the initiative track, they can't pick it. Protogen is next, and they choose to use the event moving to the bottom of the initiative track. When a scorecard is selected, that player takes their choice of the bonus sectors and places it face down on the scoring track. Each player may now play one kept card for its event. Once those are resolved, reveal the bonus tile. Those areas will score these points, while all other areas will score this amount. To score an area, you need more influence than anyone else, and the player with the most fleets in an area wins ties. If the region matches one of your faction's two objectives, you score extra points. Play until the last scorecard is revealed. Why would you like this game? The Expanse is a game for people who want to try a GMT style game, but are wary of the rules overhead that comes with something like Twilight Struggle or Fire in the Lake. It takes the essence of those games, strips away a lot of the complexity, making it a lot easier to teach and learn. The initiative track and being able to use events on other players' actions is really solid, and it helps keep people focused on what's going on on the table. And the different factions do have some variable player powers, which is good. And I'm told the expansion does a lot to make them feel more unique as well. The best thing about this game is the player-controlled scoring. This leads to some of the game's best decision points. However, if you're after a game based on the adventures of the crew of the Rocinante, Miller, and Bobby, this is not a game for you. The expansion theme is there, but it's a veneer, and it feels like one of the least thematic adaptions I've played. There's also a sameness to the event cards you pick, with most having small impacts. We also found that the opportunity cost and paying victory points to keep cards wasn't all that great an option. For a less complex area control game in space, try Galilean Moons. And if the core mechanics appeal, but you want something deeper and more involved, try Fire in the Lake. The Expanse. Space is cold and dry. Kia ora koutou, and welcome to The Networks in about 3 minutes. It is a game for 1-5 to five players. The solo mode uses the network cards. Playing time is around 60-90 to 90 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. It's time to play the music. It's time to light the lights. It's time for an hour of shouting. That's what we have scheduled tonight. Who the hell is going to tune into an hour of shouting? What do you mean it's the highest rated show amongst octogenarians? If that's the case, why are we running ads for hipster consoles? Get the schedule manager in here immediately. I want to have words with them. You win if at the end of five seasons, you have the most viewers watching your network. Competitive. Only one player can have the most powerful television network. Drafting. Players alternate picking cards from a publicly available pool. Player turn. At the start of the game, select the board that matches the number of players and put out the matching number of cards of each type into a central area. The four types of cards in the game are shows, which you must develop and run to score points, stars, which boost the popularity of shows, ads, which gain you money, and network cards, which have a myriad of effects. Let's follow one player through a turn. They currently have three shows running. The black cube shows what season the show is on and the numbers to decide how many viewers. This show will only get two viewers this season, so so needs to be replaced quickly. We choose an available star from the public area to star in our next show. They cost us five money, leaving us poor, and we place them in the green room. For our next action, we take an advert, gaining three money. This ad will also gain us one money every season the show it is attached to runs. We pick this show to develop, paying its cost. We discard the star from the old show and add that show to our reruns. The show we developed must have a star attached and can also have a second star or an ad. We attach both the star and the ad to the show. You can also attach stars and ads to other shows as an action. We then take a network card as an action and finally drop in budget gaining six money and two viewers. Each show scores a number of viewers based on its current season, stars and time slot. Our new show is on at the wrong time which is hurting our viewers so we play our network card to counter that. Total up your viewers and advance your score marker. Then age all shows by one season and place your reruns in the archive. If you ever gain three shows of the same type you get a bonus. You either draw three stars and keep one or draw three ads and keep one one and some money. If you ever have five shows of the same type, draw three network cards and keep one. Why would you like this game? The Networks, despite its appearance, is a very solid drafting Euro game with an element of set collection and engine building as well. The game is only five rounds long and planning what your channel will look like as the game goes on is quite rewarding, as is boasting about your amazing lineup to your competitors. The art really appeals to me as do the splashes of silly humour, but that's not why I play the game. I play it because it's a nicely designed, sharp card drafting game. We're prioritising what you draft is absolutely critical to how well you perform. There's also an expansion which dramatically changes the game with each player having a very different type of network to run. The best thing about this game is how it handles parody. It relies on tropes rather than direct statements. So this character isn't Juice Billis, for example.
people. However, you can sometimes be at the mercy of what cards are available and that can scrap your plans. If you have four sci-fi shows and none come up in the last season to complete the set of five, there's not much you can do about it. And the art won't be for everyone. For a much simpler game about making a movie, check out Grave Robbers from Outer Space. And if you like set collection and drafting, you could also consider Museum. The Networks. Crappy television, quality game. Kia ora koutou, and welcome to Tigris and Euphrates in about three minutes. Review copy used. It is a game for two to four players. There is no solo mode. Playing time's around 90 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. One of the cradles of civilization was the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East. In particular, the land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. The Sumerian, Akkadian, Assyrian, and Babylonian empires all rose and fell between the rivers. Will your monument stand the test of time, or will your empire become a curious footnote in a Wikipedia entry? The game ends when the tar bag is empty or the second to last treasure is claimed from the board. The winner is the player with the most points. Competitive. Only one player can win this game. Tile placement. Placing tiles and leaders is the core of the game. Player turn. At the start of the game take a screen, the four leader tokens with the matching symbol, six tiles at random from the bag, two calamity tokens and one unification token. There are four types of tiles. Farms, markets, settlements and temples. And each player has four leaders. Priests, kings, traders and farmers. Note that players do not have a color in this game. On your turn you take two actions. One action is to place a leader. Leaders can only be placed adjacent to a temple like so. You can also place tiles. Note that only blue tiles can be placed on the rivers. If you place a tile matching your leader type, collect one VP. A kingdom is a connected set of tiles, and multiple leaders from different players can coexist in the same kingdom, as long as they are different types. However, if the bull player placed a red tile into this kingdom, the jars player would get the one VP. And if no leader matches the tile placed, the player with the king gets the VP. If a kingdom ever connects two treasure tokens, the player with the green merchant can collect one of them. If you ever have four tiles of the same color on a square, you can replace them with a monument. Monuments give the player with matching leaders one VP each per turn. A calamity token can be used to ruin a space, which can break a kingdom in half. If you place a leader in a kingdom and a matching one is already there, a revolt happens. Each player gets one strength for each temple adjacent to their leader, and one more for each temple they play from their hand. The loser removes their leader, and the winner gains one red VP and one for the leader removed. All tiles played are discarded. If two kingdoms are united by a tile, a war occurs. Place a unification tile to show this. Then as the lion is the active player, they attack with their blue leader. Each blue leader gains one strength for each blue tile connected to them. The attacker then plays tiles to boost their value. Unfortunately, the defender has lots of matching tiles, so wins. The loser removes their leaders and all supporting tiles, and the winner gains one VP for each of them. Redraw up to six tiles after each turn or war. Why would you like this game? Tigris and Euphrates is a unique game. There's nothing quite like it. Kingdoms rise and fall, and control of them changes hands constantly. It's a game that rewards daring plays and people who can keep track of an ever-shifting board state. If you thrive in chaos and confusion, this is a game you should really check out. But beneath all that chaos, it's really a game about maximizing the number of points you get each turn. Your final board position counts for little. Production values are solid, and the leaders are nice and weighty, and the tiles are good quality. The best thing about this game is you never feel like you're out of it. Even if you lose a lot in one turn, you can jump right back in and steal someone's kingdom from them. However, if you are someone who likes to build an empire in peace and slowly accumulate power in a game, this one will not be for you. Everything you build can be smashed or stolen from you. And the game requires some emotional resilience. I've heard some horror stories about playing this game with people who hate losing. If you like smashing empires but want something with more silliness, check out Small World. And for a more sedate game about placing networks, check out Power Grid. Tigris and Euphrates. Flipping tables since 1997. Kia ora, and welcome to Villagers in about 3 minutes. Preview copy used. I'm also using the coin chest from the same Kickstarter in this preview. The regular game comes with different coins. It is a game for 1-5 to five players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is 30-60 to 60 minutes. It's a pretty simple game. Europe is being devastated by plague and disorder, and you have set out to create a new life for yourself. A new village you can call home. The village needs to attract skilled workers and craftspeople in order to grow. So you set about starting up some basic industries. Can you attract the best and the brightest to your village, or you simply end up being the mayor of a forgotten dung heap. You win if at the end of the game you have the most money in your village. Competitive, and only one village can be the wealthiest at the end of the game. 
Card drafting. You will build your village by drafting cards from the table. Set collection. Villages belong to different industry groups that work together. Player turn. You will start the game with only a pair of founders, five random villages in your hand, and some coins. Each turn you will draft two villages, plus one per food icon in your village, up to a maximum of five. You draft once and then play passes to the next player, and repeats until all players are done. You can take one of the cards in the road. If you do, place it on your village square, and replace the drafted card with the leftmost card from the stacks above the road. You can also choose to draft from the face down piles above the road. You may not know exactly what you'll get, but the backs of each cards tell you what set they belong to. Once drafting is done, building your village is next. See that these villages mention a chain, with the swineherd going on top of the founders and the truffler being placed last. Villages in a chain must be placed in the correct order. You can build twice, plus one more time per build icon in your village, up to five. But before you do that, you may need to to get some basic villages to start off chains. We have the Thatcher we want to include in our village and a Vintner we don't mind losing. So we place the Vintner back on any stack and get a basic villager, in this case a Hayer as a replacement. This allows us to both place the Hayer and the Thatcher in our village for our two build actions. Note we won't get the third build action from the Thatcher until next turn. Some cards used to unlock cards with padlocks on them. See here the Blacksmith, he can unlock the Locksmith. Which means if you control the blacksmith, you get two coins from the bank. But if someone else controls it, you must pay them two coins. And if there are no blacksmiths in play, those coins go to the bank. Play proceeds until the second stack above the road runs out. Then you play the first market, where you gain coins based on the gold coins printed on your villagers, plus any they earned from unlocking. The game ends with the second market, which is the same as the first, except silver coin abilities like the locksmith also count. Why would you like this game? Villagers is a real gem of a game. It has simple rules, but the ability to draft from multiple places and the different potential build chains in the village can make for a lot of tough decisions. Villagers that get you extra drafts and extra builds don't deliver big points, so there are a lot of opportunity costs in the game. As well as the main production chain villagers, there are a wide variety of solitary villagers who provide unique bonuses, as well as special villagers who can really shake things up. The fact you can draft villagers from the road or take a gamble on the cards above really opens the game up. And the art style is wonderful, vibrant, and a little different, which makes it stand out. The best thing about this game is when you use a special villager to pull off a sneaky but powerful move. However, as not all cards are in every game, sometimes you can spend a long time waiting for some combos to emerge that never do. Your plans have to be adaptive, and this game is ripe for hate drafting, as you can see what someone else is building towards and draft a key component of it away from them. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Viticulture in about 3 minutes. This is for the Essential Edition and I've not played the Non-Essential Edition. It is a game for 1-6 players. It has a solo mode using Automa cards. Playing times around 60-90 to 90 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. You are a couple who has just inherited a dilapidated vineyard in Tuscany. You have lofty aspirations of taking this land and turning it into a premier vineyard whose product is wanted all over the world. Will your wines be hailed as sublime and find their way into the cellars of the rich and powerful? Or will you simply be another vineyard making Chateau de Cardboard? The game ends the turn one player gets to 20 victory points, although the winner is a player with the most points once that turn ends. Competitive. Only one player can have the most prestigious vineyard. Worker placement. Placing workers in spaces allows you to take the associated actions. Note that some spaces are only available at certain player counts. Player turn. At the start of the game, each player gets a mama and a papa card. These cards determine what your starting resources are. You get a board showing your vineyard. This is where you will build upgrades and manage your wine business. But the core of the game is taking action on the main board that impact your vineyard. The turn takes place over four seasons. In spring, starting with the first player, you select a place for your rooster on this track. This determines your order for the rest of the turn and gives you a bonus. In summer, you can use yellow spaces to place workers. For example, this allows you to play one summer visitor. The middle spaces give a bonus. In this case, an extra visitor card can be played. You can claim the middle space first if it is available. Visitor cards give you a one-time bonus when played. If all spaces are occupied, you can use your ground day worker and still take the action. Here you can draw vine cards and here is where you plant them. Vines have different strength of red and white grapes and different building requirements. If this player had both matching buildings they could plant these vines here. Note that this field has a max grape strength of 7. Other summer locations allow you to upgrade buildings, gain money or sell fields. In the autumn phase you draw either a summer or a winter visitor and if you have the cottage you get one more. Winter actions function just like summer only on the blue locations. Here you can play winter visitors and this one allows you to draw wine orders. 
orders. These spots allow you to harvest fields, make wine, and fill orders. Harvesting a field adds its total grape value to your crush pads. Wine strength is limited by what cellars you have built. To make a red or a white wine, simply move the grape markers to the matching numbers in your cellar. To make a rosé, combine one white and one red. And to make a sparkling wine, one white and two reds. Wine orders require you to remove wine of at least the strength shown on the cards from your cellar. Each order gives you victory points and increases your residual income. At the end of the turn, reclaim all workers, age all grapes and wine one step if possible, and collect your residual income. Why would you like this game? Viticulture is an incredibly accessible game with a theme that is easy to grasp and non-confrontational. The whole package of Viticulture is that of an elegant board game. The theme is also one that appeals to people who won't normally touch sci-fi or fantasy. Mechanically, it is in the fabled sweet spot of reasonably easy to learn while having enough depth to challenge all but the most beardy of gamers, at least for a while. All the fundamentals of worker placement are in this game, but it's safer and less passive-aggressive than most. The Grande workers in particular make you feel like you are never 100% locked out of taking a positive action. The best thing about this game is the soothing process of planting, harvesting, bottling and selling. I love games where mechanics feel intrinsically connected to their theme. However, the visitor cards can cause some dramatic swings. One game in particular I played in, I went first, played two summer cards and two winter cards and had an unstoppably good position on turn one. Are you more interested in beer? If so, check out Brewcrafters. And if you want a full service cafe and hotel, try Grand Austria Hotel. Viticulture, now all we need is a good game about cheese. Hello and welcome to War of the Ring in about three minutes. It is a game for two to four players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is around three hours. It's a pretty damn complex game. A shadow is rising in Mordor and the free people of Middle-earth are unprepared. A council has been called by Elrond of Rivendell. A plan is hatched. The ring will be destroyed in the fires of Mount Doom. But can the Fellowship make it there in time? Or will the ring bearers fall prey to the ring's corrupting influence? The free people win if they manage to get the Fellowship to Mordor and destroy the ring. The shadow wins if the ring bearer gets too much corruption. Each side can also win a military victory. Competitive. This is a head-to-head -head game. Asymmetric. The two sides in this game have different win conditions and abilities. Dice and card management. Actions use dice and dice power special cards. Player turn. You start by drawing one card from each of your decks. Then you get your action dice. You will have less of those at the start of the game, but can earn more. The shadow may place eye dice in the hunt box before rolling, but all eyes rolled eventually go there. These dice are used to take actions. You can use this die to draw more action cards. Action cards can be from the character deck, which focuses on the hunt for the ring and leaders, or from the army deck, which has a more military focus. Although all cards can be used in combat instead. You can use this die to move armies with leaders one space. Or the shadow can move all the Nazgul or you can detach members from the fellowship. It is also used to move the fellowship. The shadow player then makes a hunt roll using the dice equal to their eyes and succeeds on any six. You gain a re-roll for the fellowship's last location being in a shadow stronghold or where there are shadow armies or Nazgul. After each move, add the action die here. This adds to future hunt rolls this turn. If the roll succeeds, you draw a hunt tile. Some do damage, which you can take as corruption, kill the current guard of the fellowship, or kill a random companion. They can also reveal the fellowship. You then place the fellowship on the board, a distance away from their current location, based on this track. Being revealed is bad, but you can hide with this die. This die can be used for any other action, but can also upgrade Strider or Gandalf at the start of the game, no factions are at war. You can use this die to advance them, although the final step can only be taken if they are activated, either by the shadow attacking them or by a character awakening them. Muster can also be used to gain new troops and leaders. March allows you to move two armies, one space. Combat occurs when you move into an opponent's space. In combat, you roll up to 5d6 based on the number of units you have. In a standard combat, you hit on 5+, plus, or 6s in sieges. Each hit removes a model, although elites can be replaced with regulars instead. You can also do this to make a second attack in a siege, reducing two elites to regulars. Combat cards can have a big impact on battles. Play continues back and forth until you run out of dice. Why would you like this game? War of the Ring is a masterpiece of combining excellent wargaming and strategy with its incredibly rich theme. The card-driven nature of the game not only brings the theme out incredibly well, it also allows you to change up the history as events unfold in a different order. The way the Fellowship works is brilliant, 
brilliant, as you can keep them together or send them off to help with the war. This game is amazing at creating memorable stories and moments. It also looks really good on the table. The best thing about this game is its wonderfully executed asymmetry. Both sides play very differently, but they still feel balanced. However, this is a three plus hour long war game in Middle Earth. If any of those three things puts you off, it's probably not for you. Star Wars Rebellion shares a lot in common with War of the Ring, and for a simpler game focused solely on the Fellowship, check out Hunt for the Ring. War of the Ring, it glitters because it's gold. Kia ora koutou. this is Welcome to Dino World in about three minutes. Kickstarter edition, review copy used. This is a game for one to many players. It has a solo mode using Automa cards. Playing time is under an hour. It's a reasonably simple to moderately complex game. Ever wanted to design your own dinosaur theme park? Well now you and up to 75 of your friends can do exactly that. Just grab a pad, a trusty pencil, and you can design the park from the ground up. Will you wow your visitors with your amazing exhibits? Or will your guests simply be snack food for the dinos. You win if you have the most points at the end of eight turns. Points come from many sources, including what dinosaurs are in your park, visitor cards, facilities, and the optional public objectives. Competitive. Everyone is trying to build the best dinosaur theme park. Roll and write. Each turn, someone rolls dice, and then everyone writes stuff on their play sheet. Player turn. There are two modes of play in this game, light mode and danger mode. For this recap, we will focus on light mode and talk briefly about the changes in danger mode later. We will also only talk about playing the game with of less than 10 players. To start, grab a score sheet and then deal three visitor cards to your left and then three more to your right. You are competing with the players on either side for these objectives. Then deal out two facility cards, one of each type. Everyone will use these facilities. Then someone, and it doesn't matter who, rolls three dice. Every player uses the same roll. Record these dice results down here each turn. There are three possible actions you can take and you can only take them once each per turn. Build paths, build pens, and build facilities. Paths cost a number of dice pips based on their shape. Straight paths cost one, as do corners. T-junctions cost two, and crossroads cost three. Note you can spend multiple dice on the same action if you want to. Later on, if you want to change a path, it costs four to turn any path into a crossroads. To build a pen, you need dice matching the values here. Note that the T-Rex needs seven, which will require two dice. Draw the pen to the size required for the dinosaur, then add the required generators and mark those off. Generators will work for all adjacent pens. Finally, draw the absolute best dinosaur you can. Facilities require a matching die to build. You then draw the shorthand facility symbol on the board. At the end of your turn, if you meet the requirements of a visitor card, you can claim it. If both you and your neighbor do that on the same turn, you both claim it. Not happy with your dice roll? You can use research to change the results for yourself. Danger Mode introduces special labs, which can be used three, two, and one times respectively. It also changes how generators work, has security and danger scores, and the dinosaurs can break out and cause problems. Plan until all eight turns are finished, then total up your score. Why would you like this game? I've not played a lot of Roll and Writes, but this one seems a step up in terms of complexity and depth to most. There are a lot of different levers you can pull to change how each game will play, from the massive number of visitor cards, through to the different techs that are available in Danger Mode, and the many different facilities. The version of the game I have also has options for aquatic and flying dinosaurs. So this game would best suit people who enjoy Roll and Writes, but want something a bit chunkier than normal. The best thing about this game is laughing at how terrible my art skills are. However, like many roll and writes, the bulk of the game is spent staring at your own player board in quiet contemplation. For a game that can have a massive player count, it's light on actual interaction. And the player sheets are really dark, while the pencils provided are quite light. After one game, we bin them for darker pencils, and I use sharpies for the review so you can clearly see. For a far heavier game about running a dinosaur park, check out Dinosaur Island. And if you want a roll and write that doesn't require drawing, try Gans Schön Clever. Welcome to Dino World. Roll and scribble. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Wingspan in about three minutes. It is a game for one to five players. It has a solo mode using Automa cards. Playing time is around an hour. It's a moderately complex game. You are an avid bird watcher keen to spot the birds of North America in their habitats. So build your hides, grab your binoculars and get your notepads ready. Will you be the greatest ornithologist who sees and documents the widest variety of birds? Or will you spend your day staring at the same three mallards over and over again? You win if at the end of four rounds you have the most points. Points come from many sources including birds, eggs, public and secret objectives, 
just look for this symbol. Competitive. Only one player can be the greatest bird watcher. Engine building. Placing the right birds in the right places can trigger powerful effects. Player turn. At the start of the game, decide if you will be playing friendly objectives or competitive ones. Then randomly assign four objective markers. You will score one of these each turn. Then collect the player board, two secret objectives, five bird cards, and one of each food type. Keep one objective card and any number of birds, paying one food per bird you keep. You start with eight action cubes. As you will use one each turn for scoring, each new turn will have one less action. There are four actions in Wingspan. Play birds, get food, lay eggs, and draw bird cards. To play a bird, place an action cube and then place the bird card. And pay the food cost shown at the top. It must also match the environment you are playing it in. Placing birds in any row other than the leftmost one requires you to spend eggs as well. Take the food action to get more food. Place a cube and gain the amount of food shown from the bird feeder by taking a die matching the type you want. If you have birds on an action, you get improved benefits. In this case, two food. Not only that, as your action cube moves left, you get to take the brown actions on your birds. In this case, you can gain one grain from the bird feeder and keep it or cache it. Cached food is worth victory points. If the bird feeder runs out, restock it. The lay eggs action allows you to place eggs on any birds up to their egg limit. Eggs are also worth victory points. And finally, the draw bird cards action allows you to get more cards, either from the three face-up cards or random one from the deck. Some actions allow you to spend resources for extra effects. For example, spending an egg to draw a second card here. More birds on a row means more powerful effects and more brown abilities activate. Keep playing until four rounds are over. Why would you like this game? The obvious thing to call about this game is its wonderful production values. Every component, including the eggs and tokens, is exceptionally well made. The game is really easy to teach as it only has four core actions, and the theme is exceptionally family friendly. It's also a game with very little negative interaction between players. There's a ridiculous number of bird cards in the game. Some activate on others' turns, some give bonuses when played, while others can stockpile other cards and resources on them for in-game points. But the art on the cards, the factual information they contain, and how that is all gamified elevates the game's presentation to the next level. The best thing about this game is when you build a good chain of birds and can activate all their effects. However, you have less control over what birds you can play than you might think. Finding good combos almost happens by accident when you fortunately draw the right cards, as there are only three face-up cards to choose from and card draws are limited. The secret objectives are also quite hard to get a good return on, due to the limited number of birds you draw in the game. And finally, the game's end can sometimes be anticlimactic, as players alternate taking the lay eggs action to maximize victory points on that last turn. For another easy to teach, family friendly game from the same publisher, check out Viticulture. And for a deeper and more complex card based engine builder, try terraforming Mars. Wingspan needs more Kereru. Kia ora, and welcome to Yokohama in about 3 minutes. Review copy used. It is a game for 2-4 players. There is no solo mode. Playing times a little under 2 hours. It's a reasonably complex game. In the 1850s, Japan was still a closed and feudal country. Strong armed diplomatic tactics led by the United States coerced Japan into accepting foreign trade, opening up the country. Japan decided that massive reforms were needed to catch up to the West, and in 1868, the Meiji Restoration began. You are a business owner in this period of intense technological Technological advancement and societal change. Can you create the mightiest Zaibatsu in Japan? You win this game if you have the most points when one of the many end game conditions is met. Competitive. Only one player can have the most successful business. Victory points. There are many ways to score points in this game. Area control. Where you place your workers and chairman is the key to winning. Player turn. On your turn, you can place two workers in any one region, or three workers in three different regions. You then move your chairman to any region that has a chain of your workers between where you start and where you finish. You then take an action in that region, based on the total number of pieces you have there. Here we have two workers and the chairman for three. We can see that the reward for a three action is three yen, so we collect that and remove our workers. If you must move through someone else's chairman, you have to pay them one yen, and chairman cannot share spaces. If you take a four or higher action, you can also build in a region. We place one of our shops on the region card and claim the reward of the area we placed in. Each player will have a warehouse and a hand of pieces. You can only play the pieces in your hand. Warehouse actions allow you to add pieces to your hand. Workers are free, shops cost 2 yen, and trading houses costs are shown below. Shops add to your strength in a region, so this action is 5 strength, which allows us to claim the one-off bonus. We can also build our trading house here. This means anyone else using this region needs to pay us 1 yen. There are 4 types of basic resource creating regions. 
tea, fish, silk, and copper. Three utility locations for trading, money, and warehouse actions. Two different ports for collecting trade orders. Trade orders require you to spend a certain amount of resources to gain the rewards at the bottom of the card. And there are two different technology regions. Technologies grant you powerful ongoing bonuses, as well as foreign agents, who you can spend to take a bonus action. Finally, there is the Custom House and the Church, which allow you to spend resources to claim spots on the matching Victory Point board. Why would you like this game? Yokohama is a sandbox game where you're open to pick your own path to victory. The way workers are placed in this game and the benefits of taking higher value actions means you have to plan your moves out several turns ahead, but the actions of other players mean you must keep those plans quite open. There are a huge variety of orders to fulfill and technology cards, the latter of which can really impact on your playstyle as the game evolves. And the variable layout is one of the best I've seen. This means you really can't create a plan before you actually start playing. The best thing about this game is that it's about a fascinating bit of Japanese history designed by a Japanese game designer. It feels genuine to the source material and unique in how it plays. However, while no game system in Yokohama is particularly complex, its openness can be really overwhelming. On your first turn, you have a million options and figuring out where to start is a challenge. And once you know the game, the openness can lead to analysis paralysis as you try to plan your turns and where others will be. Expect long turns with new players and those prone to AP. Want something similar but a little more focused? Check out Energy Empire. And for a similar but simpler game, check out Istanbul. Yokohama, wakarimasu ka? If you enjoyed this video, like it, subscribe to the channel, and check out our Patreon.